Thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to the city manager for the overview of our discussion for this afternoon. So thank you, Mayor, members of council. Tonight we have as an agenda item an update on the residential development in the UDO, and we have Allison Craig that will provide that uh, update, as well as we have a closed session item, Mayor, a real estate matter. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Manager, and members of Council. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about um, an update to the UDO, kind of what we've been seeing. Um, so the way I'm going to lay out the presentation this evening is first setting the stage. Um, where are we now? Um, of course, when we are talking about evaluating how we're doing the UDO, the, the most important thing is to point back to our comprehensive plan goals. And then I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of um, submittals, um, we're about nine to 10 months after the UDO has gone into effect. And then I wanna talk a little bit about market trends. Of course, um, the market doesn't solely drive our decisions, but it is an important thing to understand when we're planning for the future. And then I wanna give a brief update about um, an update to uh, from the Transportation Planning and Development um, Committee referral. Um, that was a referral from last summer. Um, and talk about an, an upcoming text amendment that we will be filing tonight related to conservation development, and then discuss some other recommendations that uh, I will be making this evening that we'll discuss more um, in committee. So first, starting with Charlotte's vision, of course, um, the comprehensive plan is born from many years of community engagement, talking about what we wanted to see in our future. And as a reminder, the UDO is a tool that implements the comprehensive plan. And so we continue to evaluate what we're seeing to make sure that we are aligned with our comprehensive plan goals. Um, and so, and then recognizing that while we have these goals in place, there are different ways in which we can implement these goals. So I wanna highlight two from the comprehensive plan uh, tonight. First is goal number two, neighborhood diversity inclusion, that Charlotte will strive to have a diversity of housing options by increasing the presence of missing um, middle density housing. And number three is housing access for all. Charlotte will ensure opportunities for residents of all income to access affordable housing. So I think we can all agree that these are two very important goals to the city of Charlotte. But I think over time, and we've, we've been talking about the comprehensive plan and the UDO and even seeing what we've been uh, receiving in site plans is how exactly um, do we implement these goals and we may not always be on the same page about that. So I want to stop for a moment and just highlight what we're seeing. So um, we are really seeing a limited number of new infill duplexes and triplexes. When we talked about these goals in the comprehensive plan, this was a source of many, many conversations, concerns that we will see um, rapid change in our communities and, and wanting to make sure that we are not um, introducing change too fast, particularly in neighborhoods that are vulnerable to displacement. Um, so we implemented controls in the UDO that helped to regulate height and sort of driveway cuts to help manage these changes. And a result, we haven't really seen a lot. We've seen about 140 duplexes, about 100, or I'm sorry, about 140 duplexes and about 20 triplexes since the UDO went into effect. Um, right now, if you look out in the skyline, uh, there is a ton of apartment activity. There is a ton of construction going. It is booming for sure right now. But what I want to make sure you are aware of is that there's not a lot in the pipeline that's coming um, after that. It is a very challenging constru uh, uh, cost market, so the construction costs are very high. And frankly, the lenders are not lending on these types of projects right now. I'm expecting that this will be the conditions for at least another year, if not two years. We're not seeing rezoning requests even. If you go back and you look through some of your last rezoning meetings, there's really very little to no apartments being proposed. What we are seeing is many, many requests for townhomes. You're seeing that in the rezoning process. There's tons of requests for rezonings um, um, in, your, um, in your packets. We're not really seeing anything um, as it relates to single family housing. It's really mostly um, townhomes. And these are great because they're an opportunity to increase our ability for home ownership. So we like townhomes. 
The other thing that we're seeing by right is that most of the subdivisions that are coming in since the UDO went into effect, uh, about 90% of them that are coming in by right um, are being submitted using, with duplexes and triplexes, using a conservation development option that is something that um, is an option to deviate from the base standards in the UDO. So, and the reason why people are using this is because um, the market is strong in attached units. Um, they need smaller lot sizes, but um, we, we think that we need to right size this tool to make sure that we're actually getting the conservation that we need. Um, I wanted to talk through a little bit of market trends. And so this is a, a graph showing from 2018 to 2023, the number of new building permits that have been issued. And so like I was talking about, um, and you've seen tons and tons of apartments, that very top uh, color there in green, you'll see that particularly over the last three or so years, we've had a boom in apartments. This isn't surprising. Um, there's a lot of interest in living in South End, a ton of apartments going up there. Um, we, in 2020, we did an alignment rezoning for TOD, so went ahead and city proactively rezoned. Um, the TOD corridor, and so there was a lot of development by right. So you're seeing a lot of activity in the apartments. You're not really, um, we won't really see a lot of the effects of the UDO in this figure because um, it didn't go into effect till halfway through 2023. So this is really just what was happening in the market beforehand. A couple other things to note, um, you can look at the bottom color, that dark blue. Those are the number of new building permits issued for single family detached, and you can see that those have been declining over the last few years. And then in turquoise, those are your townhomes, and you can see that, that the, the demand and the number of building permits issued for townhomes has increased over the last few years. I want to talk a little bit about pricing, and so um, just these are Charlotte average home prices for new construction from 2018 to 2023, and you can see in 2018 the numbers between uh, Single-family homes and townhomes and homes were fairly similar, and while they've both increased over time, you've seen a much stronger increase in the average cost of a new single-family home than you have in uh, for a townhome. And I'd even say the trends are going up for single-family, and they're going down for um, townhomes. So while I wouldn't say that $418,000 townhome is affordable, it's certainly more attainable than um, than $550. Four thousand. Um, in terms of new construction closings, and so this is the number of new construction closings for single-family detached townhomes and condos since 2010. And what I want you to notice on the bottom with the, the darker blue, again, the single-family, that the number of new construction closings in 2023 was the lowest that it has been since 2012. And we've continued to see an increase in the number of uh, constru new construction closings for townhomes. And in fact, in 2023, it was almost equivalent to single family homes. I wanna uh, just remind you all that uh, the work and the, the recommendations that I'm presenting here tonight, they do relate back to last year's referral to committee. Um, we have come before the committee three different times. The September update was fairly brief, but we did um, present some um, some considerations in August and in February. And some of the things we really wanted um, council to focus on is thinking about um, in these subdivisions, in these larger developments, looking at the quantity of the units, so how many units you're getting, the quality of the development, and then the location, like where the, the, the development actually is. So this evening, um, after this presentation, and we'll be filing a text amendment for conservation development. Again, we discussed this in committee. And so I want to just uh, walk through what this is and why we're making this um, uh, text amendment now and um, wanting to proceed with immediate action. Is that again, it's a development option in the UDO that allows you to deviate from the base standards in N1 zoning district. Uh, allows you to reduce your lot size by 50% in exchange for additional open space. But what we're finding is we're not really getting what we intended. So a conservation development is a tried and true planning concept. It's been around for decades. And the idea is that you take a traditional layout of a subdivision and you cluster and allow smaller lot sizes so the open space is not in, in the individual larger lot. It's uh, protecting large 
larger areas of tree save, open space, conservation area, um, while allowing some additional density. Instead, what we are seeing, um, and this is uh, an example project that's been submitted, what we're seeing is not really getting at what we had intended. And so I'll point to a couple things. Um, you'll see in the top right, you've got units that are fronting other units. So uh, the 43 through 45, you probably can't see those numbers. But those units where the first red arrow is, they are actually facing the side of another building. You've got uh, the development is very close to existing subdivisions, so there's not really a transition that's, that's there that's adequate that we believe. Um, again, the, the open space is it's smaller, it's fragmented. And then I think the most important thing to note here is that you've got, while you've got a couple public streets, there's a series of alleyways that are throughout the development. And with alleys, you're not, um, there's no requirement for street trees. Um, it, they may be less expensive now because the streets are, um, they're not as wide, there's not as much area as a public street. Um, but you're just deferring the cost. So ultimately, the responsibility of maintaining those alleys goes to the HOA. So while it's less expensive right now, it will come back in terms of maintenance to be a requirement that the, the homeowners and the property owners will have to then pay for. And then there's some concerns about emergency service and if solid waste can access. So we're proposing a text amendment. Again, I mentioned it will be filed tonight. This is really feel is closing a loophole and addressing some unintended consequences in the UDO and really focusing on increasing the quality and the quantity of conservation and open space. So that would be an additional 15% of tree save uh, to be a, a total of 40%. Right now, in order to, uh, if a project that is two acres inside could, uh, size could use um, this development option and we propose we increase that, that to five. So again, you're creating larger areas of quality open space and increase the minimum dimensions of open space um, so you have larger areas and make sure there's clear standards of what usable open space is supposed to be. We'll add a, uh, pr a perimeter buffer requirement and require lots to front onto public streets or open space. So again, going back to that um, quantity, quality, and location, uh, this text amendment I think really addresses um, the concerns about quality, but indirectly because you're requiring additional things to be set aside for public streets, for open space, um, and for a perimeter buffer, it will result in a decrease in the number of units. So we've been before the UDO Advisory Committee, I've uh, met with um, uh, a number of different stakeholders, and then we'll have two info sessions for uh, feedback to staff on April 2nd and the 9th. We'll have information on Charlotte UDO um, website, we'll send out emails, we'll post it on social. And the schedule is, again, we're filing tonight, it'll go to Planning Commission, a public hearing is set for April 15th, go to zoning committee um, later that month and then requesting council action on May the 20th. So as it relates to this, again, um, staff's been doing a lot of research in the background and I wanna talk about two recommendations that I wanna bring forward tonight and then we'll certainly go back to the transportation planning and development committee for further discussion. The first is um, prioritizing new housing supply and key locations. And so there's a reason why everyone is using this conservation tool that addition, uh, smaller lot sizes are needed for new development projects. And so we wanna create a new um, type of development option called compact development. This is something that other cities have. have um, we had something, a version of this in the pre-UDO standards. Raleigh has something similar. And so we allow smaller lot sizes and we allow, um, allow projects to reduce these lot sizes if they're an affordable project or if they're a development that's located near a center, high frequency transit, um, priority areas for housing supply, and maybe explore other priority locations. Again, this is um, new and exploratory and we're gonna be working uh, in more detail with different stakeholders to talk about what this would look like. So right now in the UDO, the way the lot standards are set is they're set so that you're protecting existing neighborhoods. And so they are larger um, because we wanna protect the lotting patterns of existing neighborhoods. Um, but when you're creating a new subdivision, you're in, in a sense creating a new neighborhood. Um, and so we wanna be able to allow um, flexibility in these lot uh, standards uh, to make sure that we're getting the kind of projects that we want. So this example shown here, this is an affordable housing project. It's in an N1A zoning district. 
which has a 10,000 square foot um, minimum lot size. And what they're really wanting here with these duplexes, they're for sale affordable duplexes um, to reduce the lot size to 6,000. And I think that this is um, a, a great concept for making sure that we're allowing different types of housing, particularly affordable housing in our communities. The next recommendation is um, talking about right-sizing housing diversity. So in neighborhood one, we have six different zoning districts, A through F, with A being the least intense and F being the most intense. And while our lot standards reflect a gradient of intensity from A to F, we haven't really allowed for that gradient of uses um, um, uh, in terms of the allowable uses in those different districts. And so the proposal that, that we have before you today is that um, on infill lots and in new subdivisions that we limit triplexes to corners only and the zoning districts N1A, B, C, and D. Triplexes can be challenging because there's a, there's a, um, a challenge between maintaining the pedestrian environment but also recognizing that there's cars and driveways and driveway cuts and it's really hard to um, to have both of those. And so thinking that it's better to ha have triplexes on a corner where you could have driveways on two different street frontages to really space that out. We also recognize that there is a lot of demand. There's ownership opportunities for townhomes. So we want to allow townhomes, they're not allowed now, and then one E and F, and potentially even incorporate those into the compact development option. Because again, townhomes, there's a lot of demand for them, there's, um, and there is a lot of opportunity to provide additional home ownership through uh, a townhome. And then lastly, um, you know, we haven't seen a lot of duplexes, as I mentioned, and so, um, in fact, I think the, the latest numbers that I've seen, it's a little bit less than what we've had in prior years. And so, we need to look at those standards to make sure that, um, that duplexes are viable. Again, these are a great product, they've been around, um, for decades, we've always allowed duplexes on our corners, and so making sure that we do have an opportunity to see more, um, more of these. Um, so, I wanted to show you a map. These are um, uh, these are all the uh, all the different neighborhood one zoning districts in the city of Charlotte. So, again, what I'm proposing um, is that right now we allow single-family duplexes and triplexes in all of those zoning districts. And so what I'm proposing is that in, an, in one A through D, that triplexes are only allowed on corners and that in E and F, we introduce townhomes um, to those zoning districts where they're not allowed today. You can see from the map, there's not a lot of purple and we don't have any N one F on the ground today. Um, so this would require a rezoning, um, but it would be consistent with our policy uh, and meet our needs and the goals in the comprehensive plan. We will ultimately, after the community area planning process, there'll be an alignment rezoning where we will um, go through and, and align the zoning with the policy map. And so at that point, the city proactively will be adding more of ENF, um, but that will be after the area planning process occurs. So the schedule for this, for both of those recommendations, again, I've mentioned that we've spent the last few months doing a lot of research and analysis. We've been working in the background. We've hired a consultant to do some testing and do some market analysis for us. And really, uh, the next few months, wanting to get some additional feedback from the community for the compact development option, I think it's really important to engage the design community um, just to, because it is very, very technical. Um, and we aren't laying out sites and, and doing site plans and making sure we have those individuals in the room to make sure we're, we're getting that tool correctly. And then, of course, going to our advisory committee, having stakeholder meetings, having in-person and virtual engagement. We'll have more information on all of our social and websites, send out emails. And so we'll have more information to go to um, the committee and planning commission in April. In May, um, again, the same um, same groups uh, file uh, potential text amendments then and public hearing and council action in June and July. And so with that, I am happy to answer any questions. I mean that they'd like to have a discussion with you. Um, we'll start with Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you had a 
I think it was slide number four. So 90% of residential subdivisions submitted are duplexes and triplexes. Um, so this wouldn't apply to those that have already submitted their plans. So this would be moving forward. How many units approximately are we talking about here? Um, there's probably uh, 1,500 or so. Um, there's a, a good number, um, but again, there's a lot of activity. And so and I'll, I'll say to a lot of these projects that are being submitted, um, they look like two and three unit townhomes. Um, so they're not um, in the traditional form of a duplex that you might see in some of our older, more established neighborhoods. Um, but yes, they are, um, they would all be, so once you uh, have a complete submittal in, then you are held to the regulations that are in place when you submit it. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Craig. So, <clears throat> Go back to the slide where it talks about what was the intention um, where you had side-by-side -side comparison. Um, I think it was one of the first ones. Which, tell me again, I'm sorry. The slide where it talks about the intent of uh, having this in as part of the UDO. Are you talking about this slide? Yes, okay. right. So, um, Certainly, I like that with this amendment, we will be able to preserve our rich tree canopy. I know that I've been advocating for it for a while, especially our open space. Um, as our city grows at such a fast pace, open space and green space continues to be a challenge. So having that as part of this amendment would certainly help. But at the same time, there is another part of the equation, which is the housing density, right? How do we address our affordable housing crisis by having more housing uh, density? It doesn't necessarily mean, to your point, that 414,000 unit is affordable, but it's more affordable than single family home that would cost 550,000. Um, I, you know, I, I need to, uh, understand this more in depth. Um, I don't, um, at this point, I'm, I'm just, this is a new concept. Um, I, I, would need, I would need to see more data um, because I feel like we just went through this exercise a year or two ago and it's not, it's been only a six months or eight months and we are back at it again. Um, so I, I just, um, there's a lot that we need to uh, unpack here um, before I can say, hey, I'm on board with this. But certainly I appreciate how this would help us create more open space, green space, also preserve neighborhoods character. Um, and, and for projects less than five acres, this wouldn't apply, right? Uh, right now, uh, projects less than five acres, so two acres or more, would be able to use these provisions, and we're recommending that we go to five so that um, you are getting larger expanses of open space, but the compact development option that I talked about would be two acres um, and more. So again, like trying to make sure that we're, we're getting that housing supply. And I just wanted to mention, too, um, I, I just you know want us all to remember that you know, we haven't really updated our regulations in 30 years, and we're trying to tackle housing affordability and tree canopy and stormwater and conservation and so many different things. And regulations can be very, um, the words are very important and very impactful. And so a very slight change in a word could mean that you're putting homes on alleys instead of on a public street. And so wanting to make sure we've got that right. No, that, that's fair enough. I think having a specific example, Allison, would help. Hey, uh, here is an example what would be developed under current uh, language that we have, what will be developed under this amendment. I think having that side-by-side -side comparison, having an example would certainly help us. Uh, most of us are not planners, uh, land use experts, so I think having that would sort of help me understand what are we trying to get to, right? Sure. Um, how about infill where it's less than an acre, right? We often see that. Uh, any changes to that? 
So the infill changes that we're recommending are um, in terms of the uses. And so the only changes really would be um, limiting triplexes to corners and introducing more townhomes, which are not allowed in our N1 zoning districts. So, so in terms of um, allowing townhomes, limiting triplexes to corners, uh, ultimately we are trying to take away density, uh, which rightfully so in certain instances, uh, but you know we introduced a lot of this uh, regulations around stormwater and a uh, lot of nuances that was part of the UDO in pro with the promise that they'll uh, they'll get more density, right? So I think as part of this overall analysis, I think having cost analysis would be also important. And we did that exercise as part of the UDO. Uh, I know Mr. Drake said asked for a cost benefit analysis as part of the UDO exercise. I think having that would also be helpful um, and having uh, this is UDO and what would this be under amendment from the cost perspective. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, I'll, I'll touch base with you one on one to sure. really um, dig deeper. And I just wanted to say too, um, you know, I'm a very strong proponent of affordability and housing supply and really what we what we've ties density where it's most important and so i think it's really more about um, making some adjustments so that we are getting housing supply in the areas that are most important and maybe recognizing that in our less intense districts that maybe that's not the place to put um, the highest density so yeah no that's that's well said um, thank you all right mr. Driggs thank you mayor and uh, miss Craig thank you so I want to be clear we're talking two things here right <coughs> one of them is addressing the cluster slash conservation issue mm -hmm. and the other one is the referral mm -hmm. um, so on the cluster conservation thing uh, I, I regard this as essentially closing a loophole. Like we had that provision with a certain idea in mind, and the idea was that if you could create a, a, a contiguous open space for the benefit of people, <clears throat> then the, their individual homes could be on smaller lots. Uh, that's not what we're getting. So we're on a faster track to try and address that. Uh, the concern I have, Ms. Craig, is that we uh, exclude the uh, plans that we think are, um, you know, not respectful of our intent, but without denying our original purpose, right? So if someone comes along with a plan that does align with what we intended previously, is that going to have to change because of what you're suggesting, or would that plan still work? So, I mean, the plan, so it depends on if it's been submitted or not. And so, I mean, anything that's been submitted would follow uh, past regulations, but we would work with other individuals that may be in a preliminary stage of sketch plans or like preliminary designs to talk to them about how how to meet the, the new, the updated regulations. But, but, but what I'm saying is if somebody comes along with a brand new plan that was fine according to what we intended, is that now not going to work because of changes that you're making in order to combat what we consider to be improper? I mean, if they've designed the site without buffers, without public streets, um, without adequate open space, then they will they will have to make some adjustments if this amendment is passed, um, and it probably will result in um, a reduction in units. So uh, that's a little more than just excluding the things we didn't want, and that that's that concerns me a little bit. Uh, the other question I had was. Roughly, uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit, but how much extra density are people getting because of the fact that they're doing this the way they are? Like, or, or putting it differently, if we now apply the new rules to some of these plans. Every site's different. It depends on how it's shaped and what the topography is and all of those sorts of things. So I've seen anything from a 15 to a 30% reduction, but it really depends on the site, and that's just an initial stab, and, yeah. and I'm sure a site designer would probably have a We used to assume different. it was about 20% in the, under the old. Uh, so um, talking about the effectiveness, uh, you said we would work with people 
we need to be pretty specific about who can proceed and who can't, right? And so given that we only have a six-week line, there are going to be people who have been working on something for a while, right? So are we going to make clear what can still move ahead and what can't? Or is the intention on May 20th that that's it? Uh, nothing else passes. I mean, I th I think that because of the concerns that we have for things like <clears throat> emergency access and um, the maintenance of streets and things that I think are really critical for people who may not even understand that um, when they purchase a house or they rent a house in, in the neighborhoods, I think it's I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we are protecting those individuals. So. Uh, this will be discussed in the UDO uh, advisory committee? It, it has been in March. It was discussed, yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm just interested to hear if there's a, an industry response there and uh, make sure that's part of our overall deliberation. So as to the three recommendations, are those the uh, – uh, is, is that your answer to the referral? Or is that just – I mean, it, will it be more related to the referral? Or are I, those really the only things that we, we should expect? Uh, at this point, these are the three things that I think we should be prioritizing. I think, again, it's right-sizing um, where we want housing. We've heard some concerns about some large developments um, with duplexes and triplexes and really intense development in the ETJ. Um, we've heard a lot, of, um, a lot of concerns there, but we also have heard from our housing advocates how important housing supply is. And then we're in a market right now where townhomes are, they're being financed, they're being built, and they're providing home ownership opportunities. And I, I think that these three recommendations really will address the concerns while still allowing for us to, um, to say that we're implementing our vision and making sure we're providing housing. And those would apply for two acres on up? The compact two acres and more. But again, I mean, those, these are, early concepts that we want to work, that one in particular needs to be um, worked through with the design and development community because it is so technical. Um, and then we can talk, uh, of course, with uh, more broadly about just the policy implications of, of allowing these in, in areas, in targeted areas where we want to grow. I mean, some of this goes right back to what we were talking about so heatedly a couple of years ago, but uh, I'm glad at least that we are now uh, yeah, tackling those things. But uh, uh, thank you for that. Good presentation. Thanks. Ms. Watlington. Thank you. I've got a couple of things. Um, firstly, I think that in terms of effective date, that's really <clears> up to how many of us around the dais are happy to have it go into effect. So I think we can talk about those kinds of things in terms of when we'll see those changes. I myself am fine to um, to go ahead and have this new update effective upon approval, but I'm open to conversations about what that runway could look like. Um, my question for you, Allison, is on slide four, where it talks about the 90% residential subdivisions. I'd love to see where those are. Sure. Do um, we can, we, I don't have a map in the deck. Um, but we have mapped that, and I'd be happy to provide that in a follow-up. Awesome. Um, and then my next question, uh, or not so much a question, more of a comment on slide five. What jumps out to me, even as you mentioned that the 2023 increase in multifamily is not necessarily reflective of the UDO, um, I find it interesting that we have this activity, and I wonder how do we match and map that towards what our true goal seemed to be in the beginning, which was about missing middle and about affordability, because to your point, where a lot of these are being built, it really attracts a different type of customer, not necessarily uh, those folks who are not able to pay that market rate or that luxury uh, price point. So I just wanted to hear your comments on, on that. What do you think is driving this multifamily piece? Is it just the the market irrespective of our policy? I think it's it's an, a, a few different things. I think there was a lot of pent-up demand um, from the pandemic. I think that there was a lot of interest in um, living in South End. I mean, there's a ton of people moving to South End. Um, I think, it, I mean, certainly a function of us rezoning the blue line um, and having TOD by right and having that transportation um, available there. I think that also drove things. So I think 
it's it's that you have um, maybe less of a. I, I think some of our our younger generation may prefer uh, to not live in a single family home. Um, they are looking for something that's more about the experience and less about their space. And so we see that with these smaller lot subdivisions as well as apartments. And so there really wasn't any other option. So it was either a multifamily or it was a single family home and that they may want something in between. So, but we didn't have that ability. So people were going to apartments. So it's a, a number of different things, but again, I think that everything that I've heard and learned and in the market is just that there is no lending for multifamily. So, I mean, we'll probably have another spike in 2024 because you're going to have a lag, you know, but then it's going to come back down. Okay. I also think it's interesting that um, if you look at the numbers now, it's about 38% more expensive still to purchase a home versus renting. So I think that's certainly prohibitive, which speaks to the need, in my opinion, for more ownership um, options. My next question is about slide six, and I know I've asked you this before, but I just want to um, offer it up again. Um, I would love to see our peer cities who maybe have not implemented some of these increased density because I want to see what impact that has on the <coughs> price differential between single family detached and town homes. Because certainly as there are fewer and fewer single family detached, of course I would expect their price to rise. But I'm very curious to see um, if we can understand what role that, that density policy has in creating a price differential or minimizing it. Sure. Then as I go over to um, slide 11. So looking at these two, if I'm understanding it correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the intent is for the same space to have the same number of units. It's just that they're, because the lots are smaller, you get more green space. So uh, there's different approaches to conservation, particularly over time. I mean, I think in the most, uh, like when it was originally conceived, it was that it's the same number of units, but um, you know, a lot more open space. And I think now the way conservation is leaning, I think there's an allowance for more, a little more density, as long as there's a significant and uh, meaningful amount of open space provided. I don't think we care as much about, is it, you know, is it 10 for 10 or is it 10 for 15? It's more about like what you're actually saving. On the side so right and so i think this is very much a win-win and that it preserves open space it preserves permeable surfaces but also you don't necessarily see less units you see smaller lot sizes which should translate to a more affordable right product mm -hmm. um, so I, i'm happy to see these particular changes when it comes to recommendation number one on slide 16 I just want to call out there that as you mentioned wanting to make sure that we still preserve the character of existing neighborhoods, I wanted to know how you all are thinking about subdivision in particular. What do you mean when you say subdivision? Because there are places in our city where we have neighborhoods and then there are adjacent areas that may be completely different in character in terms of that development, but they flow together as if they were one neighborhood. So how are we thinking about delineating, I understand infill, um, and neighborhood character, but as we talk about tra uh, transitioning from one neighborhood to another, how is that, how are you all thinking about that? So that's one of the things that we're wanting to add in the conservation is allowing more, um, more transition area. And so this compact development option, um, you know, prioritizing uh, development where we need it the most. Maybe that transition is a little bit different or smaller than it might be for conservation. We This is a new concept for us, and I think it's going to take us a little bit of time to develop, but I've, you know, we're trying to find that happy medium between researching it and analyzing it, but also recognizing that um, we need more housing, and attached housing is an option and is important for townhomes and home ownership. So um, like we need to we need to have a tool for that, mm -hmm. but um, we, we don't need to rush it, but we need to find a solution. Quickly. Absolutely. So I would just offer up as you all are figuring that out. And I know, like you said, you don't have all the answers, but um, let's think about not only what's in neighborhoods and avoiding infill development that doesn't match, but also thinking about how those sure. neighborhoods, even if they're subdivisions, connect to each other and their impact on each other. Um, on slide 18, where you talk about um, limiting triplexes to corners, or really you can go to slide 19. 
where you've got the, um, yep, here. So I'm curious as to in N1A through C, or A through D really, I see that you're making, you're recommending that we make the change from triplex is allowed to triplex is on the corners only. Why are townhomes not included here or are they in, baked into A through D? So um, when we, when the UDO went into effect, um, townhomes outside of like, I think two buildings were only allowed in neighborhood two. And so we really went back and thought through policy and looked through our goals and think that really what the, the policy was intending to do was to allow higher density or higher, higher intensity residential development in our higher intensity zoning districts. And so right now you can't outside of a couple buildings um, unless you're, you know, um, unless you rezoned to N2, you can't do townhomes. And so we think it's important to introduce back. So then I, w I mean, I'll say this, that I could be more comfortable with allowing townhomes in some of those lower intensity uses, particularly because they provide an ownership mm -hmm. option um, versus the triplexes on the corner. So I don't know what the rest of council feels in that way, but I would welcome townhomes as an option in the lower intensity areas as long as they're done, obviously with respect to the um, character of those neighborhoods. Um, and then just in general, as I link this back to the conversations we were having earlier with the budget, I think we've got to think about strategically, how do we link our dollars to our development policy? Um, and if these are the types of development that we are trying to um, encourage, that has to show up in how we incentivize development all the way through our budget and our bond cycle as well. Um, one of the other things that, just as we're having those conversations that I think is important to think about is beyond just new development, how do we use our dollars to not only direct new development, but also uh, leverage existing development? Because we know that there are, there are vacancy rates in a lot of these buildings, and so we don't necessarily have to subsidize building new ones, but we probably need to figure out how to um, further leverage the programs that we have that are specific to letting people uh, or creating attractiveness of allowing yeah. folks into these uh, vacant prop vacant units in some of these existing um, properties. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, uh, Ms. Craig, thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you for, for meeting with me last week. So I don't have any questions, really. Um, um, I have a, some comments I would like to make for the, for the record um, and to some of my colleagues. Um, you know, one of the things that we said we would do when we passed the UDO, and we acknowledge is that it was not a perfect document, and that there will be steps along the way where we would have to make amendments or changes um, based on what we saw happening on the ground. And we've done that before. And I think the first text amendment that you outlined uh, is another example of, you know, s seeing what's happening on the ground uh, <clears throat> and immediate making um, the appropriate corrective action uh, to ensure that we keep the integrity of the UDO moving forward. So I think that's really appropriate. Um, uh, number two, A and B, gives me a little bit of hot burn um, because it's, it's almost like deja vu, right? Uh, and, you know, part of what we said was that the 2040 plan that we had adopted and the UDO was not for how we are living today, but how we see our city and people and planning live tomorrow, 2040, 2050, 2060, and making the tough decisions necessary today uh, for a better tomorrow. And so... Um, um, part of what I think we have, to, and I think we've done that, right? Uh, and and I'm open for it, amendments and changes. Um, but you know, part of what I think as a council that we have to do uh, for the development community and our residents and our neighborhoods is, as it relates to the UDO and planning, is provide a level of certainty that people understand what the rules of the games are and that we don't uh, change the rules in the middle of the game and, and have people go back and redo their work. I think that's, that doesn't bode well for Charlotte as a, a, um, a friendly community uh, to do business in from a development perspective. And on a bachelor, I'm, I'm pro-development, plan growth, plan development, um, 
good infrastructure, good land use policies, um, good vision for the community, right? I think that's what makes our community grow and, uh, and prosperous. And so um, I'm a little concerned that we got the onion out and that we're peeling it back. And I'm almost certainty um, starting tomorrow, uh, we're gonna get a lot of um, phone calls, right? Um, because of the uncertainty of uh, what, what people can do and what they can't do and what the, the future holds. The UDO in itself was a series of compromises uh, among the developers and residents and even members of this council went back and forth in terms of trying to get a, a document that wasn't perfect, but the document that we all agree that we can move forward with, um, and, and we did that. So. I hope that as we go back to the community, that we're really intentional in terms of the community engagement um, with a wide variety of audience uh, to ensure that we have some certainty um, that that timeline we try to address um, so that we can make a decision, yay or nay, sooner than later. Um, so people can have an understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it and, uh, and they can understand what the rules of the games are. So, um, you know, um, I'm a team player, right? So I'll, I'll go along with it. But, you know, some of the questions that I've heard and talking to my colleagues before this meeting is, I mean, we're, we're getting in the weeds. And, you know, been there, done that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it is, um, we did know that by, you know, changing and updating our regulations like we haven't really done that um, we weren't going to get everything right. And I completely agree with you about certainty. I mean, the community wants certainty. The development community wants certainty. Council wants certainty. And so um, I think I think we're just in a period where implementation is new, and so we're learning and we're trying to make um, informed and data-driven decisions. And I think um, th th this will not remain this way. I think it's just about making sure we're getting it right. And so I, but I, I, I appreciate your point. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I really appreciate appreciate the presentation. I think that um, some, one of the things you said that one of the things that that might have been overlooked was, and, and you can re repeat it if I if I paraphrase incorrectly, but we didn't focus initially on where those high density needs should be. And I know that as one of the council members that was opposed to the UDO it was for that reason. I think some of these I know that some of these challenges were foreseeable. And I think that that's all that we were trying to communicate. Um, you said development where we need it the most. Can you define that, please? I mean, we may all have different opinions about what that looks like, but I do think that it is very important to have housing next to transportation options. Um, and so I think that's key, which is why we, um, we rezoned along the blue line is making sure that we're connecting housing and transportation because that's a real cost. I also think um, the activity centers that are outlined in the comprehensive plan and um, in the policy map are areas where we're focusing um, on creating that 10 minute neighborhood. And it's also, you heard earlier today, Ed talking about the strategic investment areas and he mentioned centers, like we're trying to connect the dots of, um, of infrastructure and housing and density. And so by really focusing on those centers, I think we're trying to complement those. And so um, those would be the first things that come to mind, but there are, there may be others as we start to talk to the community that we may need to think about. So. One of the things that I would add is, let's take a look at the infrastructure. So I think that was just an important piece and that's why we pushed for the infrastructure discussion. If we can balance the, the infrastructure capacity, if you will, or, or uh, funding or plan with these, these high density areas, I think that's what we talk about when, when, we, when we say responsible and strategic development. Um, In looking at the map, 
Can you show a picture of the map or the slide with the map, please? One of the things that Council Member Ashmira said, she talked about a comparison. I'd also like to see that comparison, um, what was allowed in that neighborhood before, or just more definition. If we could get more definition, and Council Member Watlington mentioned it or asked that question also. So single family duplexes and triplexes on corner lots and in N1A through N1D. So prior or right now, quadplexes are only allowed on arterial roads, is that correct? So that kind of detail, if you can um, give us that information. So the proposal is that quadplexes would be allowed on the same lots where, where duplexes and we haven't quite figured that out. So quadruplexes are, are um, sometimes like there's it's actually a, a good picture of one on the bottom right here. Um, I think a lot of a lot of in, in the past they were built as like two up, two down. So it's like the same footprint as a duplex. Um, it's a great product product, particularly um, when like in the UU we talk about it uh, requiring an affordable unit in order to build them. So we are, but then they're also sometimes built in, in four in a row. So it's essentially a four unit townhome. And so I, I, we are still trying to figure out what we might want to change with that. But um, I appreciate you connecting me with um, a developer that's wanting to do something like that and ha is struggling because it's not allowed. And it seems like a great product um, and a great, certainly, she's talking about handicapped, accessible, and right. affordable. And so I didn't get into that because it's kind of a nuanced part of it, but we are looking looking at that. And maybe expanding, because right now they're only allowed in all the districts on an arterial with an affordable unit. So is that, and so we need to see that. If, yes. this, if this change is going to be, that, be the same or if you're considering it we will. We are considering it. something different, but we just haven't figured that out yet. Okay, so we'll get more detail on that. And then, I was a little confused. I heard, I heard three different things um, for this change. I heard two acres or more, five acres or more, or one acre, or more. So what can you, like, explain the, the, the changes, um, yep. that you're proposing? So conservation development. And that's, you know, we're reducing the lot sizes. That would be five acres or more so that you're, you're, the, the area that you're conserving for open space and tree save is higher. There's a compact development option um, in priority areas, which, you know, we'll continue to talk about. That would be two acres or more because I think those are probably smaller projects um, adjacent to centers or adjacent to transportation. And then there's the change, um, this last one about right sizing housing diversity. And so this is, would be for infill lots and for new subdivisions. Those, those three, um, those three changes. And that's one acre or more. No, this, I mean, so, um, this would be on infill lots. So like an individual lot that's in any neighborhood from N1A to okay. N, so it could be 10,000 square feet, half an acre. It just depends on what the lotting pattern in, in that particular district is. Because what I what I okay. don't want to see, or I don't think residents want to see, is a quadplex uh, allowed on a, a small infill lot. Sure. I would make sure we were going to stay away from that. Okay. Yep. Um, and as far as, and we had this conversation on our small group meeting, the housing demand for single family. Um, I'm, I'm with Council Member Watlington when we talk about the, the sales versus the, the demand. Those sales or the closings don't necessarily illustrate the demand, I, I, I think, because there's just, it's kind of a limited product at this point, right? So how do we increase the number of single family uh, development in in the city. Is there a plan for that? I mean, do we? Uh, that that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to still, if we can, um, take a look at single family development. We heard that Goldman Sachs presentation. I don't know if you've had a chance to pull that, but we want we don't want to ru run the risk of having too much multifamily in the city, and we have vacancy rates. So I'd still, because we hear from residents, we if we'd still like to. Um, 
if there's a market for it, I, if, if we can incentivize build, builders, I don't know what that looks like, but I think that single family is still, there's still a market for that. And then lastly, if the market's changing and we have so much multifamily pending, do developers have an option to, I guess, to come back and, and give us a, a new petition or is there, a, is, is there a plan or an option for them to reconsider what's being built? Is that just the regular uh, redevelopment process or what can happen? Because I know there's a lot of multifamily pending development in, in District 4. If there are any developers that, you know, want to take advantage or recognize the need, it's, it's their plan or what, what would happen? So any any project that had gone through the rezoning process for multifamily and they wanted to do something different, they would have to come back before you all with a new plan and a new public hearing and a new vote. And so in order to change course like that, if it's a conditional plan, they would have to come back. Are we seeing that? Because I, I think we've talked about one multifamily development in my district that because of the market needed to change or the developer was looking, to, I guess, to sell the project or are we seeing that um, right now? Are you seeing, I mean, we're seeing some, or I mean, and there are still people that are going through and wanting to just keep their entitlements and wait and see how the market transpires. And so it's hard to say because it's the financing conditions that are very challenging right now. And so I think a lot of developers are kind of waiting to see how that plays out. So do you have a list of petitions that are delayed or? Um, I mean, we could certainly go back and look at approved projects and reference back to those that haven't started um, the, develop the permitting process. I mean, that's probably something that we could create. I'd like to see that for District okay. 4, at least. I don't know what the other uh, council members would like to see, but I would like to see that. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's sure. all I have. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'll just start by saying I'm a little confused by how these ref recommendations came from the referral to see how duplexes and triplexes in larger projects developing by right uh, are impacted in the UDO, but I'll, I'll put that aside. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, I, I just think holistically as I look at all this and I remember back to the two years of very contentious battles that we had over this topic, there were a lot of things that many of us saw as fundamental problems with the UDO that made this moment and the moments we're still experiencing very anticipatable. We absolutely knew there were some things that were coming and we screamed it as loud as we possibly could uh, and we weren't able to be successful there. But two of the biggest ones were the capping of l large development density i.e. heights in certain areas that were not logical. Some things have been adjusted, but really we were very conservative as it related to large projects and density, which we knew we needed, and we were uh, uh, very uh, aggressive on small developments. This was abolishing single-family zoning. I think that's the crux of one of the greatest flaws that we had committed during that time, and that's why we had a razor-thin vote and I think the biggest lesson everyone learned out of this is don't make massive city changes on a razor thin vote because a lot has to happen and be figured out. And if the foundation is not firm on that, there's gonna be a lot of problems. So uh, Council Member Graham left, but it's funny because we were opposed to each other in that two year period. And I find myself in absolute agreement with this statement right now uh, on the, um, Really, you know, what's what, what are the impacts of what we're doing? I can't, fa I mean, it hasn't been a full year that this has been the law of the land and we're circling back saying, okay, well, it's time to make these changes now. Um, you know, the two goals of the UDO, in my terms, were simplify the ordinances to the, to the building and the, and the community at large. That's predictability. They need the predictability to be able to operate in these worlds and for us to continue being moving you know, things around doesn't make a lot of sense. And then increasing the units that are available to meet the demand that is growing in Charlotte. So for me, I mean, I have a really big problem. I still stand firm on my position from the two years going into this, but for staff and for Mr. Manager, for you guys to hear, there's two things that will, will be non-starters for anything that I'll vote on. I have to have these 
before I support anything. Number one is it, it can't be an ordinance or a change that says these are the rules for this part of town and these are the rules for another part of town. It has to be consistent, which is why I, I'm just curious at a glance, and I'm just seeing this for the first time, so I need to have time to talk to staff, but you know, 2.1 was the abolishment of single family zoning. I don't know what's changed between now and less than a year ago that would give us this aha moment, but why would we, rather than make things more complex, just not go back and reverse 2.1 if that's what we're gonna do? Can't be a political reason as to why 2.1 was implemented to begin with. It needs to be an actual reason why that isn't the thing we're actually doing, or are we trying to soften its wording and say, well, this part of town, it's okay to do that, but not here. And then number two, I don't wanna talk about another thing until we get serious about infrastructure. We constantly hear this, we heard it in the last zoning meeting, where these neighbors who are now experiencing all of these very anticipatable moments that the UDO has brought, they're asking, where are you guys at with your responsibilities of water and stormwater, sidewalks, roads, all the infrastructure necessary? And the answer is, we've done nothing since then of materiality compared to how much time we continue to spend on the rules to dump rocket fuel on development and growth. So uh, I, I appreciate the fact that some of the things we predicted are coming to fruition. I don't appreciate it, but I recognize it. And the wrong answer is to go and try to create, here's a little, you know, thread the needle here, there. That's how we had the Frankenstein patchwork quilt that was the ordinances before. And we are in danger of following down that same path. That's, that's how these things occur. So let's fix it, let's fix it correctly now that people seem to be recognizing that. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Allison, for the presentation. And I was able to connect with you last week to ask some specific questions on, um, on the recommendations here. So I, I don't really have a lot of questions. What I would say though is that on slide five where you have the market trends and we understand the mac macro dynamics that are going on from an economic perspective, but you know, I think what I'm hearing you say in addition to addressing the conservation portion that's being abused is also saying that we need to be uh, malleable for diverse housing types. And what we're seeing in the, in the marketplace overall is, you know, the baby boomers who dominate the employment market and they are they dominate it, dominating the home ownership percentage as a whole they're going to they're exiting out of out of the workforce and downsizing that's a trend that's been occurring and will continue to occur over the next few years conversely we have uh, just at a national level you, you know we have 70 percent of the millennials saying they would like to be homeowners but they can't afford it due to high costs and they don't make enough money. And so introducing opportunities for a diversity of housing types in a way that makes um, sense and respects the aesthetic and charm of established neighborhoods, I think is a, is a good strategic outlook approach. So I, I'm looking forward to, as we continue discussions on this particular um, recommendation and hearing from the public as well, um, what we're hearing the public here in Charlotte say. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Mayor. All right, I think everyone has had an opportunity to speak to the issue. Thank you very much, Ms. Craig, for bringing this forward um, and making these adjustments. Um, we are very fortunate to be in a city that's still growing, very fortunate to be in a city that we can still talk about the accommodation for housing supply. We're not perfect. But I will tell you, Charlotte is above its weight when we talk about these kinds of issues. And so I, a lot of that has to do with how the staff has approached this. And of course, there'll be changes, but I know that we're in the right direction across this country if you look at anything else, any other major city like those that we often visit. Okay, thank you guys. Um, we have one more um, closed session to go into. So all of you that are enjoying this wonderful opportunity to sit in these chairs, 
we're going to go ahead and ask you that if you thank are you, not a participant in this effort, and I'm going to ask the city attorney to give us the motion to go into closed session. If we can, if we can have a little moment of. I'd like to have a motion to go into closed session to instruct city staff and negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by the city in negotiating the price or other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property pursuant to NCGS 143-318-11A5. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we I have a second? A second? Yes. We have a second. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All right, so that's unanimous.
everyone. Thank you for your patience. Um, sometimes we have time management issues, um, and so we hope that you will accept that this was one of those times for us. And so I want to call to order the Charlotte City Council business meeting for March the 25th, and I'm glad that you actually stay in um, didn't leave us right in all here. So um, let me begin um, with the call to order and then we will start with introductions and we'll start with our clerk. Stephanie Kelly, city clerk. Welcome, Dimple Ashmira, councilwoman at large. Good evening, I am Marjorie Morlina, I represent District 5. Good evening, Renee Johnson, and I'm honored to represent District 4. Good evening, everyone, James Mitchell at large. Marcus Jones, city manager. By Lyle serving as mayor. Good evening and happy holy. Dante Anderson, Mayor Pro Tem, District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Ed Driggs, District 7. Good evening, Victoria Watlinson at large. Patrick Baker, city attorney. Thank you. Um, we begin our meeting with um, an invocation that's actually supposed to help us solemnize what we're doing and make it possible for us to work together for the betterment of our city. Um, this night today, we will have the invocation from Council Member Graham. Following that, if you would like to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm gonna recognize Mr. Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Could we bow our heads, please? Lord our God, protect us in your spirit. Strengthen our hearts, especially when we have often have to bear suffering, that we may be steadfast in hope and may again experience a day of salvation. Protect us in every way. Protect our citizens, our frontline workers, and every member of our community. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance if you choose. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next section of our agenda is um, what we call our public moment of to have speakers come down and petition the council. Um, as a result of these petitions, what happens is that you're given um, two minutes to speak, and then um, we will refer that to the appropriate staff person within the organization who will then follow up with you individually so that we can make sure whatever you petition, we get it right. Um, so this is what, but we do have protocols for disruptions at our meeting, and I'm just going to be um, tell you what happens as if we have disruptions. So if the speaker um, that's down at our podiums, we have two, they come down the stairs, please be careful as you walk down there. If you are, um, your allocated time to speak is over, if you do not stop, we will say that you tell you that you're disrupting the meeting and please stop and leave the podium. If you still don't stop, you're violating GS 143-318-17 and are subject to being escorted out of the meeting chamber and charged with a misdemeanor if you do not seek to cease to talk and go back to your seat. So we know that there are many people that have very, very powerful um, um, points that they want to make, but we want to ask you to please respect and com continue to address within our rules so that everyone has the opportunity to be heard. So with that, we are going to start with our um, public forum. And, oh, I'm sorry, we have awards and recognition. Ms. Johnson oh. has, is, has a recognition for us tonight. Ms. Johnson? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I am honored for the fourth year in a row to um, read a joint proclamation to recognize March as Brain Injury Awareness Month. And I was kind of hesitant to read it today because I know that there are folks here that want to really come before us and talk about some important issues. But one thing that I know that most of us know someone in our lives that have suffered a concussion or a stroke or an anoxic injury. So brain injury affects so many in our lives and it can be life changing. So I'm honored to, to um, advocate for those survivors and read this today. 
whereas more than 2.8 Americans sustain a brain injury every year, and over 5.3 million Americans live with a brain injury-related disability, and whereas over 80,000 people in North Carolina will sustain a brain injury this year, and many survivors will be left permanently disabled, and acquired brain injury includes a traumatic brain injury sustained from blunt force trauma, and non-traumatic brain injury is from strokes, aneurysms, tumors, infections, and anoxic injury. And whereas active duty and reserve military members are at an increased risk for sustaining brain injury compared to their civilian peers. Whereas research on abused women shows that 40 to 90 percent of the victims of domestic violence suffer physical injuries to the head. And whereas research shows that up to 50 percent of the homeless individuals and 25 to 87 percent of incarcerated adults report experience the physical injury to their head. And whereas public awareness and understanding of the dangers, prevention, and treatment of these injuries and effects on the family are critical to help aid individuals in recovery. Now, therefore, we, Phi Alexander Lyles, Mayor of Charlotte, and George Dunlap, Chair of the Mecklenburg Board County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim March 2024 as Brain Injury Awareness Month in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County, County and commend its observance to all citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> So now we're going to open it up for our public forum. Um, I'm going to call two names down at each um, so that you can come down and have it each on, on each, either side. And um, you will have two minutes for speaking. And I'd like to um, recognize Reverend James Barnett along with T Tim Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes, thank you. Reverend Barnett, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Mayor and council members, I want to thank you for affording me the opportunity to come before you. I came prepared with a three-minute speech. It's been a long time since I've been here, so <laughs> it's two minutes. I'm going to make it short and get it on out, out of the way. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of the council members who have addressed this, the uh, murder rate in the city of Charlotte and around the country. We at the Stop the Killing Crusade believe that the only way you can solve this problem, the faith community has to be involved. And we're calling upon the faith community to, to get involved. I put in your package a uh, uh, headline from the newspapers of uh, 2001 when the Latino community had a murder rate of 27%. When they came to us, and now the Latino murder rate is down less than 10%. What we said is that once we care, we cause unity, we can get things done. So we come to you today after 36 years out here fighting. 45 years after the Ebony Magazine publication on black on black crime. So I'm coming publicly to invite you to a program we're having on April the 21st. It's called Unity in the Community. We're inviting Pastor Shirley Caesar to come. We're going to have a big praise and worship service, uh, calling the community to come together, to particularly the faith community, to come and take the lead and help to decrease the murder rate. I want to say, Mayor, thank you for all you've done to support us and all the other members on the council that has supported us. Uh, we're getting back out here and we're going to win this battle. Nobody can save us from us but us. Thank you for allowing me to have my two minute speech in my three minute time. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Mr. Rhodes. Mayor Lyles, council members, and city manager Jones, thank you for allowing me a couple minutes to say hello. My name is Tim Rhodes. I'm the managing partner of the Novant Health Charlotte Marathon. I just wanted to take a minute tonight to say thank you for allowing us the privilege of showing off the best of Charlotte, North Carolina. The Novant Health Charlotte Marathon runs through Uptown, Eastover, Myers Park, Dilworth, South End, Villa Heights, Plaza Midwood, Noda, and I've probably missed a couple. The economic impact of this event this past year was almost $2 million, 
and we were able to donate $138,000 to local charities, including our flagship charity, the Novant Health Hemby Children's Hospital. After 19 years, the city has played a big part of our success, from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department to the Department of Transportation, the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority, and the Sanitation Department, just to name a few. In 2023, we welcomed runners from 43 states and the District of Columbia, plus 13 countries. We have experienced 30% year-over-year growth the past two years, and this year, our 20th year, we expect over 9,000 participants. We offer a full half, a full marathon, a half marathon, a 5K, and relays, so there's something for everyone, including you. So I want to extend an <laughs> well, invitation. Maybe not, maybe not so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just want to invite you to come on down. And if you don't want to run, you can cheer and be a part of the festivities. November 16th, and we start and finish in Uptown Charlotte. Just again, wanted to say thank you. We appreciate it, and we're honored to represent the city of Charlotte. Thank you very much. Our next speakers are Adasha Lashman, excuse me, Ashmana and Ann Gross. Is all right. So we will have another. I'm Cindy Sattel. Mindy. 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 Send, oh my God. Mindy Sattel. And that kind of day. Okay. Mindy. All right. It's gross. Good evening, Mayor Lyles, City Manager, and City Councilman. My name is Ann Gross. I am a volunteer president and founder of a nonprofit all volunteer group called Friends of Feral Felines. We have been in existence 25 years and we assist our citizens to work with these outdoor community cats who are stray unowned or feral, meaning they're afraid of people. They get spayed and neutered and vaccinated for rabies and distemper. They get a left ear tip for identification. This program is being done throughout the United States and Europe. It's considered the state of art treatment for these cats. Uh, we, since um, January of this year, have done 292 cats with citizens of our, our um, community. And we'd like to thank sincerely our Charlotte Animal Care and Control uh, because they opened up at the end of January eight spay-neuter vaccination clinics for um, the community cats a week. They'll do eight cats. And quarterly, they'll do a high-volume clinic for up to 40 cats. Now, this might not seem like an important thing to do in Charlotte, but without this program, these cats are proliferating. And this program will protect them from disease. It'll protect our community. And it is a very worthwhile program. Um, it, uh, finally, it reduces the community cat, pro, uh, community cat population because they are no longer reproducing. And so it's a win-win situation. We just want our ask today is that we have the city funding like a line item budget for animal control. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. All right. Ms. Sattel. Greetings, Mayor Lyles and council members. I'm Mindy Sattel, a recently retired physician, actually a neurologist and sleep doctor with <laughs> the head injuries. Um, I'm here today as a volunteer with Friends of Feral Felines. We are deeply concerned about the population explosion of our city's unowned cats. It's staggering that if unchecked, two cats can become two million in a span of eight years. Trap neuter return is globally recognized as a humane approach. Effective TNR stabilizes then reduces populations resulting in healthier remaining cats. 
It decreases shelter admissions and alleviates euthanizing healthy felines. Euthanasia is ineffective as well as emotionally and financially draining for all. Social inequities often impact the density of our community cats in large part due to insufficient, affordable, and accessible spay-neuter services. The good news is that logistics have recently been identified which optimize TNR effectiveness across a diversity of municipalities. Logistics include intensive targeting of areas with the greatest cat density. This requires coordination and timely, affordable veterinary services. We plead for permanent line item funding for sufficient services, facilities, and logistics for the best effectiveness of TNR. Details of municipalities with successful programs are provided in your packets. Dedicated funding along with committed volunteers befit our beautiful, thriving city. Our approach to community cats reflects our ability to come together as a community for the good. Thank you for your Thank consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next two speakers are Kelsey Joseph and Tanika Nicholson. Go ahead, please. Okay. Council, thank you for your time and service. My name is Kelsey Joseph. I'm a dedicated community member that volunteers with several organizations uh, addressing homelessness, food insecurity, and animal welfare. One of those is Friends of Charlotte Mecklenburg Animal Services, helping animal care and control as they are in constant crisis, despite having an outstanding nationally recognized leadership team. This is what I wanna to talk to you about today because it affects some of our most vulnerable populations, animals who cannot help themselves and our neighbors who are struggling to meet their own basic needs. In 2017, you approved a budget for a new shelter and then those funds were reallocated. We've been pleading for a year now for you to make ACC a priority again. I, along with many others, have invited you to come tour the shelter and some of you have and we greatly appreciate that. For those who haven't, I brought some shelter information and images to you tonight. The first photo in your folder was taken on July 3rd. When most city staff members were celebrating the 4th of July with their families, ACC staff was euthanizing dogs, lifting them into wheelbarrows, and then shoveling their bodies into the incinerator, which the second photo illustrates. This is a daily occurrence at the shelter. <coughs> I'm sure you can empathize with the emotional toll that takes on city staff in our community. The next page in that packet includes a list of progressive programs that ACC implements. These are recognized in the animal welfare field for being creative and life-saving. However, their abilities are limited. Why? Because ACC is chronically underfunded. The ACC leadership team knows how to mitigate these problems. What they need is your support financially and structurally to do so. So I'm asking you to please make Animal Care and Control an independent city department and increase its budget. We do not have time for advanced planning and waiting another seven plus years. Thank you. Thank you. Anika <laughs> Nicholson? Yes. Thank um, you. Good evening, honorable members of the city councils, May allows. Um, I, Tanika Nicholson, stand before you today to address a critical need within our community, transitional housing for young women aged 18 to 25. As we, strive to, as we strive for equality and diversity, it is imperative that we recognize and address the unique challenges faced by this vulnerable dem demographic. For many young women transitioning into adulthood, their journey can be fraught with uncertainty and instability. Without adequate support systems in place, they may find themselves at risk of homelessness, exploitation, and other forms of harm. Transitional housing offers a lifeline, a safe and supportive environment where these young women can rebuild their lives and pursue their dreams. Transitional housing provides more than just a roof over their heads. It offers a wraparound services tailored to their specific needs, 
from life skills training, educational support, to mental health, counseling, and career guidance. These programs can empower young women to break the cycle of poverty and adversity. By investing in Second Chance Living, I planted a seed called Second Chance Living. It's for young women. Um, we only invest in, we're not only invested in their futures, but also in the future of our community. When these women are given the tools and resources they need it to succeed, they become active contributors to society, enriching our neighborhoods and driving, <clears throat> excuse me, positive change. I urge the city council to prioritize the development and funding of transitional housing programs for young women aged to 18 to 25. Together, let us create a brighter and more equity future for all members of our community. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speakers are Patrice Coleman and Stephanie Lance. <clears throat> Is Janice Hayes. Give me your name, please. Stephanie Laws. All right. Um, is Patrice Coleman available? All right. So Janice Hayes. Janice Hayes. Okay. Um, and so then we'll go with Nasfat Shahada. Okay. Miss Coleman, please. Yep. Me? Yes, please. Ms. Loss? Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening, City Council members and Mayor Pro Tem. My name is Stephanie Loss, and I represent the Stillberry Acres neighborhood, which is located about a half mile from the airport. My community is concerned about the lack of notice to residents regarding the rezoning petition 2023-112. Out of the 80 plus homes in our neighborhood, only one resident received a notice. Had that one resident not informed me, this could have been passed last week with practically zero community involvement, which is very concerning to me. While this, while this one petition might not seem like a big deal, it's actually a piece of a much larger puzzle around airport development and expansion. Future plans could include rezoning of a historic cemetery from residential to commercial, and turning Old Still Creek Presbyterian Church into a logistics center that would eventually host six to seven large warehouses in our community. What we are asking for is more transparency and to afford our neighbors the opportunity for community engagement. I feel the next meeting should be a comprehensive meeting with developers, NCDOT, CDA, and hopefully the continued support of council members Brown, Johnson, and Mayfield. There is a lot of great things included in the future plans, in my opinion, but my concern is the lack of transparency and that our community has had no involvement. We need more information and simply have not been afforded that opportunity. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your <laughs> remarks. Thank you. Dear respected mayor and council members, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I am Dr. Nasfat Shahadi, hematologist, medical oncologist, taking care of patients with cancer and blood disorders in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. I'm a Palestinian American doctor with deep roots in Palestine, and I have been taking care of American patients for the last 30 years. I have a large family, including five sisters, still living in West Bank. So this is very personal to me. Just last week, my nephew was shot and killed by the Israeli military. He was only 16 years old. As a cancer doctor, I frequently see patients who struggle or simply cannot pay for their cancer treatment. It baffles me how this country, my country, continues to continue to send billions of dollars every year to kill and displace my family. Yet my patients in America cannot afford cancer treatment here in Charlotte. I see it day by day. This is our sixth month asking you to listen to us and introduce our ceasefire resolution. Since cities as far as Chicago and San Francisco, and as close as Durham and Boone have passed ceasefire resolution. You may ask why we keep coming month and after month. Just last week, Canada affirmed it will no longer 
steel weapons of, or provide military aid to Israel. This slippery slope has just started and will cause the same ripple that it did when toppling apartheid South Africa. Just a few weeks ago, as active duty Air Force serviceman by the name of Aaron Bushnell passed away in a courageous show of protest against this genocide, his last words were, I will not be complicit in this genocide. Will you? Dear mayor and council members, as your constituents, it is your duty to stand with us. If we continue to fall on deaf ears, please do not come asking for our votes in November. In passing ceasefire resolution, better late than ever. It is morally right thing to do and probably beneficial to you all. It might help you to be liberated. Thank you Thank very you. much. Speaker is Michel Balag, Michel Balag, and um, Josef Hausia. See you. See ya. Can you tell me your name because I want to make sure we get the next. Mitch Balag. Mitch, and then the next speaker is Yusef. Has Nisa? No. So um, then would be Jenna Awad. Thank you. We'll let her come down those steps. And Mr. Balag, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Mitch Boleg. As a constituent and as a Jew, I stand before you with a heavy heart, urging you to pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The continued attack on the entire civilian population of Gaza is a clear case of genocide and is one of the few examples in modern history of starvation being used against an entire population as a tool of war and oppression. Other forms of collective punishment are routinely used, and war crimes such as domicide, <coughs> attacks on hospitals and the entire health <coughs> care network, destruction of all civilian structures of government and human services, massive and indiscriminate bombing of civilians are occurring every day. How many Jewish children would we allow to be slowly starved to death, not only in front of our eyes, but funded by our tax dollars? I think we all know the answer to that question. In the meantime, over 12,000 Gazan children have had their young lives snuffed out while we debate whether or not we can take this one simple step. It is really the very least we can do. What is happening is a disgrace to our civilization and a stain on our collective humanity. Passing this resolution is not a political act. It is a reaffirmation of our common humanity and basic decency. We must act now. We don't have another day to wait. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jenna Awad. I'm a Palestinian American and resident of Mecklenburg County. I moved to North Carolina in 2022, where I've been practicing as a pediatric speech language pathologist. I have dedicated my career to teaching children how to communicate and achieve self-determination. I chose this field because of my passion for justice. I have and never will be the one to stay silent through injustice, whether it be in my career or through activism for all oppressed people. Every single day since October 7th, for the past 170 days, we wake up to the most disturbing and horrific images and videos of Palestinian children being massacred. 
And yet I proceed to get dressed, go to work, where I spend my days putting on a smile, trying to be the best speech therapist I can be for the children that I serve, all while mourning the thousands of men, women, and children brutally murdered in my homeland, paid and backed with our tax dollars. We no longer need to read you the statistics of this brutal genocide for you to know that it is a genocide. We all see what is happening, and your woeful ignorance is not an excuse. I'm disgusted and disturbed that the bombs used to ethnically cleanse Palestinians are funded by our tax dollars. I refuse to accept that not one of you can stand up and advocate for the injustices that are occurring under your noses. You claim that city council does not address political matters, but somehow you have the power to amend city code ordinances that criminalize our First Amendment rights, and which got me wrongfully arrested. And now somehow you do not have the ability to sign a paper that states, we condemn the killing of innocent children. Every single one of you are complicit in this genocide. As an ed educator of our youth, as a resident of Mecklenburg County, as a citizen of this country, and as a Palestinian, I insist that you answer the demands of the people of Charlotte and stand with the side of justice and humanity by passing a ceasefire resolution. Free Palestine! Free Our next two speakers are Micah Belong and Preston Hagman. Micah? Um, okay. And Sama Erni? Er Erni? Salma. Thank you. Uh, my name is Preston Hagman. I represent the ACR, the Air, uh, Airport Community Roundtable. We represent a series of professionals, both pilots, uh, community leaders, uh, to, to better the noise abatement procedures at Charlotte Airport. We came here a few months ago and told you about the Part 150 study that's going to be released this summer. As like any big study that's been going on for two years, that's going to be delayed. I did bring some paperwork I was going to hand out at the end of this to, for you to see the new schedules. And to, for there's so much information that we've done over the last few months, trying to increase uh, the north flow, south flow departures on divergent paths to really minimize the uh, impact of noise with all the, the traffic that's coming out, especially with the fourth parallel runway coming out of Charlotte. That's going to increase the amount of traffic significantly that comes out of Charlotte Airport. So again, we have all the community leaders. We've uh, been talking to the tower and TRACON to see how we can modify the flight paths. We've already had success in raising the limits of some of the intersection by 1,000 feet, which actually lowers the decibels in the surrounding communities. And again, with that fourth parallel runway coming up, the amount of traffic that's going to be uh, uh, just overwhelming our communities, how we can mitigate those, both the arrivals and departures. Just simple little things like if we can keep airplanes going up the center of the, uh, the lake, so not to uh, have an effect on the, on the communities, and turn higher. And the same thing in, in an approach, so we're not coming against the, the communities. So again, the main thing for me coming here today is to notify you that the Part 150 is going to be delayed a few months. We're not, we're not sure when, when, but it was supposed to be at the end of May. Now it's probably going to be later in the summertime. So uh, I, again, I put lots of information for you to, you to uh, digest, and uh, we'll see you in a few months. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Appreciate the work that you're doing very much. Um, it's an important part of our, our mission to do this well and to get it right. Thank you. All right, Ms. Ernie. Ernie. Hi, my name is Salma, and I'm a senior at, in high school. Um, I'm here to share with you guys a perspective that I believe will be useful in making your decision on the ceasefire. Um, so first of all, I've heard there's a lot of opposing opinions sharing that it's unnecessary to pass a resolution because the city council can't solve a war, but that's not true. Um, to me, it's about recognizing the pain of your civilians. Uh, in my government class, in the first week or two, we read Locke. 
One of the documents that spoke out to me was that he shared citizens give the government power. It's not just Charlotte that would be recognizing the violence, but international cities as well. And as we speak, other city councils have passed a resolution, about 100. Um, I'm here today because I know you guys have these titles because you genuinely care about your people and the city of Charlotte. I know you'd want to keep them safe and validate their feelings. People here and at home have either been physically affected or have lost their direct family and friends. If you were to go on your phone right now and look up Palestine, I'm sure you'd come across a video of innocent families losing their loved ones. A woman, she went down to go get bread for her family. She came back. She saw her husband and kids buried within the ruins of her home. She tried to call them to wake up. She tried to do CPR. They clearly did not wake up. How would you react if that was your family? I, I would do the same thing. I would not believe it. I'm sure most of us would do the same. Your citizens are in pain. They're watching their loved ones disappear, knowing that they can't save them. Not just for political reasons, passing a ceasefire resolution will validate the pain that your citizens feel. It also join the other 100 US cities that recognize this violence. Please take responsibility for your title and recognize and work and stand <laughs> with your citizens that believe in you. Thank you. Our next item is a public hearing on a resolution to close a portion of alleyway between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Speak. I'd like to have Gina Kalias and Celia Kalias um, come down to the podium, as well as Rich Fennell and Greg Watkins can be in this vicinity here. Um, so with that, we will go to the item number eight on our agenda for everybody that's up, up here. And this is a public hearing, as I said, to close a portion of an alleyway between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Street. Because he kept doing me like this. He said, Look, people in the fucking eye. Mm -hmm. I know. It was a guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see that. He, he, he just sent me a personal message on. He did? He did. He texted me. Really? He just sent me a personal message. All right, so who would like to? Um, I have you listed as Gina Kalias. I'm, so you will have, um, I believe, is this two minutes or three minutes? Mr. Baker? Three. I believe it's three, three, minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Lyles, Mayor Pro Tem, Anderson, and City Council members. My name is Gina Kalias. I'm urging City Council to please deny or to continue this petition to abandon the alleyway between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Street. Our family owns Twin Oaks Shopping Center in front of the alleyway and my late father-in-law, Nick Kalias, built Twin Oaks on land that my husband's grandparents had owned. Um, Nick ran Dickety's Restaurant on Independence Boulevard and started Twin Oaks with Dickety's Deli. Then something classic came in, and currently Fern Flavors from the Garden is the main restaurant there, and they're an anchor. And this, this shopping center was designed to be anchor to be an anchor restaurant at center. Um, Suncap is planning to put the majority of the alleyways as they build multifamily condos on top. The average parking deck entrance height is seven feet. Suncap told me, told me that there was no way for any of our delivery trucks to access the alleyway from Scott through their parking deck. Um, they said the alleyway would be completely blocked for 12 to 18 months at a minimum during construction. So we would be deprived of meaningful, reasonable, and continuous ingress and egress on the alleyway for vital food deliveries and supply chain deliveries. Twin Oaks Restaurant Ferns receives 
four deliveries from an 18-wheeler from Cisco every week, and uh, you have a copy of the Cisco truck pulling through. And Cisco tells us they can only enter through Scott Avenue. They, they tell us that Fern has to have the deliveries by the 18-wheelers from the type of foods that Fern serves, and they said there's no way they can enter on Fountain View because it's too narrow. They can't turn the 18-wheeler around, and they and there's also a hill that comes in on that side, the topography. They said it would be too dangerous for their 18-wheeler to stop and block East Boulevard with their flashers. They said the average delivery is 22 minutes. So we are a commercially zoned shopping center, and it's our property zoning right to have reasonable and continuous commercial access and to expect us to have deliveries um, from our supply chain for our tenants and our customers. Amazon trucks can't get through a parking deck, UPS trucks can't get through the parking deck, our dumpster trucks can't get through the parking deck, and the dumpster has to come in uh, perpendicular to the dumpster to, to dump. Um, we have other box trucks that won't be able to come in. So um, the other thing is, is Suncap could raise the height of their parking deck to allow delivery for our trucks, or they could create a walking bridge between the condos over the alleyway. Thank you Thank very you very much. much. All right, C Celia, Elias, thank you. My name is Celia Colias. I'm the granddaughter of the late Nick Colias, a Charlotte restauranteur. My grandfather graduated from Myers Park High School in 1955, and I graduated from Myers Park High School in 2015. About 35 years ago, my grandfather directed the design and build of Twin Oaks Shopping Center on East Boulevard between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Street. Twin Oaks was built on land that belonged to my great-grandparents and at the time was home to two beautiful oak trees, hence the name Twin Oaks. One oak was sadly destroyed by Hurricane Hugo and the other oak has since been preserved as a sculpture in honor of my grandfather's memory. Before the council today is a resolution to close the alleyway between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Street, the alleyway directly behind Twin Oak Shopping Center. I stand before you to speak on two points regarding that resolution. The points are one, procedural notification, and two, the public interest. The procedure for permanently closing streets and alleys, statute 160A-299, states that a copy of the resolution must be, quote, sent by registered or certified mail to all owners of property adjoining the street or alley, end quote, prior to the public hearing. Please note, it doesn't say portion of street or alley, it says the street or alley. All of the owners of property adjoining the alley did not receive a copy of the resolution by mail prior to this public hearing. Therefore, the procedural requirements of Statute 160A-299 are not met. These procedural notification requirements exist to foster respect and to encourage good neighborly behavior. They are important and they have not yet been completely fulfilled. My second point is about the public interest. The portion of alleyway between Scott Avenue and Fountain View Street should not be abandoned without an easement for delivery truck ingress and egress. That alleyway is a vital artery for small businesses in the area, and the current plan for abandonment is a death knell against those businesses and therefore against the public interest. There are paths forward for development that protect the public interest, and this is not one of them. I am respectfully requesting that you defer the vote on this alleyway abandonment until such a time that all the parties, with council support, can come to a resolution that protects the public interest as well as the commercial property rights of small businesses whose livelihoods depend on reasonable and continuous ingress and egress of delivery trucks as part of their commercial supply chain. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Fennell. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Lyles, uh, members of the council, thank you for letting me speak. It has been a long time, and I've really enjoyed this. I mean, most of what I do is in court. And <laughs> well, you might be in one tonight today. <laughs> uh, no, seeing this has just been fantastic, and I'm grateful for it. I think it. you have a, a, a lawyer. If you've not already finished law school, you must be getting <laughs> no, close to getting in it, right? <laughs> thank you. So I just wanted to say thank you. It's been a joy to watch, and I appreciate what you all do. Um, we do understand, or I do understand, uh, that 
but progress is progress. In this development, when I was first asked to look at it, I looked at the alley, and the alley has been in disrepair for a long time. And this development is going to clean it up, and it's going to turn a 10-foot alley into a 24-foot permanent easement going from Scott to Fountain View, and that all sounds fantastic. Uh, but then when we were talking about this a week ago, when I started to go from fantastic to uh -oh, is when I found out that the, the Scott entrance is going to be covered. And I asked, the guys were very forthcoming about what their plans were, and I asked, what, is, what does this do? Can I get a truck through? And they said no. Uh, so that redoubled my interest in trying to figure out exactly what happens in the alley. I haven't had time to do a traffic study, but I've sort of done my own traffic study. And I've had some of my partners, and I have been out at that alley from 6.30 in the morning some days, in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, trying to figure out exactly what goes on back there. And is it possible to actually function if we have a restaurant that needs these truck deliveries? How do you make that happen? I think I'm pretty creative, and although I litigate for a living, I try to avoid litigation, but I can't see how it works. I can't make it go. So we've been trying to, to schedule a meeting to see if there's a way to bridge this. If they, are, if they are insistent on that cover, then I don't know what the resolution is, but I hope that there is one. The, when I was talking to them last week, we talked about Fountain View as being sort of a pressure release valve mm -hmm. for this shopping center. Uh, Fountain View, uh, the earliest I was out there was 6.30 uh, last week. And Fountain View from 6.30 to 6.35 becomes a parking lot. It is crazy. Because it's 6.30, they park. 6.31, park. 6.32, they park. 6.33, they park. I tried to get through Fountain View this weekend to see what you would do to try to get into a full parking lot at this shopping center and could not get down the street. So trying to live with just, with just Fountain View as a relief valve, beyond just the technical difficulties of getting a truck in there, it's not doable. We've got to have Scott. But we've got to have Scott for trucks. We've got to have Scott for larger vehicles than just cars. I mean, I can give you my, what passes for my traffic study. <laughs> but what, what I found is that there's a car that goes through that alley from Scott to Fountain View every four and a half minutes and I've got six different data points. What I'm trying to protect is not like I saw at 7 o'clock in the morning somebody reading his Bible while he was driving through our parking lot. Thank I'm not you. trying to protect that. Thank you very much for yes, the comments. All right. Yes, All right, we have three additional speakers, Greg Watkins, Patrick Fitzgerald, and Gary Clayson. Mr. Watkins. Yeah, his communication. Mr. Watkins. Mayor, Been Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I just want to be clear, I'm here tonight as a private resident <laughs> of Fountain View Street, and I'm opposed to the abandonment. Um, I'm also speaking here on behalf of a number of neighbors on Fountain View at 1622, 1626, 1700, and 1708 Fountain View, who are also opposed. Um, honestly, I'm kind of surprised to have to be here tonight uh, when my wife and I saw the abandonment signs go up on our street. We uh, contacted the city and were told in writing that there would be no change to the connectivity in the alleys that run north-south be behind our homes and the east-west connector um, that you're hearing about tonight. Um, but this was prior to the public hearing and we thought all was good. Uh, you know, we had it in writing that there was no change to the connectivity. But now, just last week, days before the vote on this, we, uh, we learned that the developer was planning to eliminate access to Fountain View. And we just don't understand why the city told us one thing and the developer is now proposing something else. We agree that the current use of the alleys could be improved behind the Suncap property, but we just don't see why it should uh, come at the expense of private property owners. I will say that, you know, my wife and I, we've lived in uh, our little bungalow for 25 years. It was built in 1929. It's the only home we know in Charlotte. It, uh, we raised our kids in it. We hope to retire in it. And it's been a great house and neighborhood. 
but our neighborhood is growing fast. Uh, from our front porch, we can see four cranes, uh, two at Atrium and two on a development in East Boulevard. And um, with all this growth and change, you know, who is to say how those alleys could and should be used in the future? Uh, we should not cut off this future connectivity. Connectivity benefits all residents, both old and new, and I urge you to help us find a solution here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fitzgerald? That's right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Lyles, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Anderson, and City Council members. I speak to you on behalf of the Executive Board uh, and residents of uh, 1320 Fillmore Condos, which is directly across Scott Avenue from the planned development. We are concerned that the proposed resolution will have an adverse effect on our residents. Together with uh, 1315 East Condos, we represent about 400 residents plus retail and uh, office uh, buildings and office uh, space. The two buildings together are bisected by our privately maintained alleyway between Scott and Kenilworth Avenues, which services our residential and commercial traffic. The increase in density from the 1401 East project, adding about 300 residential units plus retail and office, will generate unprecedented traffic on Scott Avenue and East Boulevard. Unfortunately, as proposed, a portion of that traffic will shortcut through our alley as people naturally take the shortest route between Scott and Kenilworth. Our alley has already suffered extensive damage from cut through traffic and required expensive repairs. Not only passenger vehicles, but commercial vehicles delivering to the restaurants, shops, and residents in both buildings and elsewhere uh, occupy, uh, take up that, that alleyway throughout the day. Um, even though there are stop signs at the entrance and exit points of our garage, uh, anyone pulling out of the garage has to be extremely careful not to get hit by other vehicles who are speeding through the alleyway trying to cut across. Previously, the developers of 1401 East proposed to mitigate the risky situation by relocating the alley on their property by about uh, 20 feet northward, encouraging traffic to go up Scott, uh, which is a one-way one northbound avenue. Thus, any vehicles leaving their property would have to go against traffic on Scott if they wanted to use our alley. Um, but only a few days ago, we learned that the developer has recanted and now proposes to leave their alley aligned with ours as it is now. They propose to install a traffic diverter known as a pork chop to channel traffic, uh, uh, to ch tra channel existing, uh, exiting traffic north on Scott away from our alley. Um, however, we've seen repeatedly where, uh, where our property is concerned, far too many drivers who are taking the shortest route again between two points, ignoring the signage and uh, creating additional likelihood of, uh, of automobile accidents and, and personal injury. Therefore, we strongly oppose and urge you to disapprove of the current plan for 1401 East and instead require the developers to revi revise their plan as it was previously presented to our communities um, so that their alley and ours are not aligned and the risk to people and property is minimized. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clayson. And then our next speaker is Ellen Citarella. All right, Mr. Clayson, please fill sure. three minutes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Gary Clayson, the president of the 1315 East Condo Board. Um, the alley separating 1315 East and the Fillmore condos serves more than 260 units. It provides regular resident access. It allows garbage removal, moving vans, service trucks, and commercial businesses. And we have to compete with vehicles that are cutting through. We are not, this alley is not able to handle the potential shortcuts for the hundreds of residents planned for this ridiculously high building that is planned for across the street. We agree with our Fillmore neighbors that the proposed alleyway should not directly connect with our alley. We already have way too many cut throughs. The proposed barrier entrance and exit is not going to deter anybody from driving right over the barrier or cutting through from the entrance area when Scott Street is clear. 
We already have to keep calling the city, unsuccessfully I might add, so that no parking signs um, are, are followed before the alley, allowing us to get onto Scott Street. That's already a current problem. The new barrier is going to be ignored as well. We ask you to find a better solution to this issue. Um, construction issues have been raised today. Um, we do expect that if this new huge building is built, you're gonna to have to find a way to effectively manage all the construction equipment and find parking somewhere for those many workers. Um, these plans are necessary because there is no parking garage availability in the area right now. The restaurant and retail stores and parking lots on East Boulevard are not an option. Um, as a volunteer at the Dilworth Soup Kitchen, I deliver lunches to the rest to the Charlottetown Terrace residents. Um, Pearl Park and Baxter Street are inundated with construction worker cars on both sides of the street for the new medical university. Um, and you probably don't know that narrow, that narrow East Boulevard is paralyzed for long periods of time during those periods when utility work was done because drivers were sandwiched into long single lanes. Scott Street, Scott Avenue was not a picnic either. So unfortunately, you'll be hearing about many of these things from area drivers as well in the future um, because this needs to be addressed. But please fix the alley issue first and realign its location on behalf of the residents in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sydney Mayor, Mayor Lyles and members of council. My name is Ellen Citarella, and I'm speaking on behalf of the DCA Land Use Committee tonight, where I serve as chair. You should have received a copy of an email I sent today to Mayor Pro Tem Anderson uh, laying out the Land Use Committee's position. It is as follows. We encourage all property owners along the affected alleyway to agree, make sure that no one is ignored. We are not advocating for any party, but we want everyone to work together for the betterment of the neighborhood. With council support, we think that can happen. We'd like to point out that contrary to the statement published in the resolution to close, no letters were sent to property owners who own parcels along this T-shaped alley. In addition, this alley closing as presented is contrary to the public interest, as you've heard, and the property owners in the vicinity of the alleyway will be deprived of reasonable means of ingress and egress as required per North Carolina General Statute 160A-299. In closing, I'd like to thank you for your consideration to this matter and for the work that all of you do on behalf of our city. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Colin Brown. Madam Mayor, Council Members, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner, uh, Suncap. Uh, do, do we have any visual aids? Is there, this is impossible to follow without looking at something. I don't know if there's a copy of this, this is helpful. So if you all can see the screen, and I, I handed out some visuals uh, in three minutes. And, and first of all, we're, we're happy to have a hearing. We're, we're happy these issues have come about. Uh, I hope you will not take action tonight. I hope that you'll continue. We're happy to continue conversations. I think as you've heard, uh, the petitioner has been speaking with property owners. But I did want to give you a little bit of an orientation. If you can see here, um, this is Scott Avenue. This is Fountain View. I don't know if you, the pointer can follow me on this. The existing alleyway is in red. And if you go out there today and look for it, you will not find it. You'll see a parking lot, you'll see all kinds of stuff, but you would not recognize an alley unless you looked at a plat and found it. Uh, an alley also, an alley, it's funny, runs north uh, behind the Fountain View lots, and you won't find that either. You'll find fences, trees, power poles. There is a, a legal alley. And so what is going on, if you look at this area in red, this is what Suncap has petitioned to abandon, an old 10-foot wide alley that lines directly up with the alley that you just heard the neighbors, their concern is these alleys line up, so the existing alley lines up with their alley. It is 10 foot wide, it cannot accommodate the types of trucks that Ms. Callias was talking about. So the old alley just doesn't work. Uh, if we decide just to leave that old alley, that's fine. It will not function and address any of the issues you've heard about. 
What the petitioner proposed was to abandon that red alley and replace it with a new public easement, which you see in blue, which extends across, that is 24 feet wide. They are not proposing to abandon the portion of the alley behind the Calais Shopping Center. Additionally, they've proposed a new easement that would connect to the alley behind the Fountain View property owners. So the proposal is to abandon about 4,500 square feet of existing alley. That's 4,500 would go away. And this proposal includes new dedication of public access of 10,500 square feet approximately. So dedicating about two and a half times the amount of publicly accessible land. We've, got, we've heard, a, I don't know that we'll be able to address all the concerns you've heard. Uh, certainly, we need to talk uh, with the owners. We want this shopping center to remain viable. Uh, we think it's a great amenity to the property next door. It is true that this blue alleyway, it does go through our building at this point. And so in this area here, there would be only eight foot of clearance. And no, a semi-truck could not move through that, nor could a semi-truck move through the existing 10-foot alley if we're limited to that. Uh, so we're happy to continue conversations. We feel like uh, the new area that we're creating in this area will provide more maneuvering. Uh, one of the concerns, again, we're, we're talking about a new alleyway here to connect up uh, to provide Fountain View access to their alleyway, which is currently not used, but it could be used in the future and we would have access to that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, that is, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? So move. All right. Second. I have Anders. Oh, we have you might want to continue that. Hmm? You might oh, want to continue sorry. it. I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm going to recognize Ms. Anderson for a motion. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank all the neighbors for coming out and expressing concern. You know, this issue was really brought up about a month ago after a meeting where Ms. Goliath, um became aware of, uh, you know, um, the abandonment and began doing um, her own studies around traffic flow, et cetera. This is a multi-layered issue. Uh, the first one, the first piece of it, I, I do want to say, just across the board, notwithstanding this particular issue, but uh, we have to correct the whole notification process uh, uh, to neighbors who have not been notified of things like abandonment, things like rezoning. We just hear that over and over again that. Um, People are completely unaware of it. In this particular case, I do understand that the Calias's property was not deemed an adjoining property and therefore they were not notified. But in those cases where it is true, we need to address that issue. What I will say is that uh, SunCap as a developer has been at the table having multiple discussions and Colin has been present as well um, with small business owners with uh, residents and with the DCA, and we have made some progress. So there is some, some positive progress throughout this process. However, there's still a lot to be uh, addressed and dealt with, and we need to ensure that the residents along that Fountain View area have reasonable access to the egress and ingress of their properties. And then we also need to make sure, um, and staff is continuing to do this to resolve the issue as it relates to uh, operation of large delivery trucks, trash collections adjacent to the Calias property as it relates to the SunCap plan. SunCap is also performing a review of the truck size to demonstrate that certain operations will be maintained. So they will be going through that exercise. And uh, they also have agreed to have maximum extent possible of openness to the alleyway during construction um, when we get to that point. So there's so many issues and challenges that the residents that small business have right now that we have not resolved. What I'd like to do is I'd like to, um, if I could, Madam Mayor, um, put forth a substitute motion and instead of adopting part B of uh, agenda item number eight, that we defer the adoption of part B to a business meeting in April. We have two, one on April 8th or one on April 22nd. Second. So that we have more time for continued collaboration. As I mentioned, 
we have made some progress, but there still has to be continued conversations, and I'm happy to see the conversations occurring. So I'd, I'd like to make that motion, and I believe I have I, a second. I have a motion, and there's a second, second by Ms. Ajmira. Any further discussion? Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councilmember Anderson um, was right on point when she talked about how this needs further conversation between all the parties. I learned about this issue over the weekend when Ms. Kalias had reached out to me, uh, and we have had multiple back and forth over the weekend, and I uh, had our um, Debbie Smith and her team has been working with Ms. Kalias, uh, petitioner, and all the parties involved, and certainly there are valid concerns that um, residents of Dilworth community has raised in terms of commercial access and um, reasonable and continuous access. Uh, as a family, we often visit Fern. That's one of our favorite restaurants. So when I learned about this, I actually drove by and I see uh, the issue here. And in fact, I wasn't able to comprehend that issue until I was able to drive by. So when Mr. Brown had done a visual presentation, uh, that was even more helpful. Uh, there is a lot more conversation that needs to occur. Uh, Ms. Anderson, so I, I don't know if we will be able to reach a resolution by next uh, business meeting. Uh, so I, don't, I do not want us to lock us in to having have a resolution by next business meeting or have this on, on in our agenda, I would like us to consider having uh, where there is a resolution and then have this on our agenda item. Uh, because if there is no resolution, I would not be able to support this uh, because there are some valid ingress and egress issues that you heard clearly from our community members. Um, I do hope that we have a resolution, but if not, I, I don't think it, there is anything pressing for us to have this item on our agenda in April. Uh, I, I would like, um, I see Ms. Smith here smiling. Um, if, you, if, if we can just have staff uh, come forward and help us uh, address some of the alternatives that they were looking into, and then also if you can address the notice of public hearing and how it went out and I'm not sure how some residents did not end up getting it but also if you can just tell us did you provide a list of all the neighbors to be notified to Mr. Brown? So good evening my name is Casey Mashburn uh, with the Department of Transportation it's a pleasure to be with you but to speak to a couple of points and particularly the notification as part of the general statutes, we are required to notify adjoining property owners, so those touching the abandonment, um, alleyway and abandonment that's in question. So our staff does that notification. We have sent out all of those requirements. We also, additionally, to notify the public, we publish the abandonment twice in the Mecklenburg County Times, so in the public uh, newspaper, and also posted signs uh, on the street to notify them. That's all in accordance with the general statutes. That, that's thank you for saying that. So, if, for those of you who did not receive notice of public hearing, if you can just touch base with them, uh, yeah. they may not be adjoining property owners. Maybe they did not receive a notice as a result of that, or maybe they are. So, we need to figure out where is the gap here. So, technically, and to answer your question directly, what is adjoining property owner? If you can just define that immediately adjacent to the alleyway that will be abandoned. So, the alleyway abandonment in this uh, instance stops at their property corner, so they are not technically considered an adjoining parcel at that point. Okay. Um, at some point, we'd like to dis discuss uh, this. A definition it's up to the council to make an amendment uh, and notify in future uh, other what that definition is and maybe expand that uh, but that's for another day if you can talk to us if you can just give us an overview about alternatives that you have been reviewing with the petitioner 
that will address community's concerns. So there are multiple alternatives that we're working through. A number of them have been mentioned uh, by both Mayor Pro Tem and Mr. Brown. And so we're working with the, the petitioner and uh, Ms. Calais and the family to look at the alternatives specifically to address the truck turning templates um, that have been mentioned here to make sure that they do have that access to their parcel. They will also maintain access on Fountain View and East Boulevard as was mentioned as well. But that is one alternative. Another alternative is also discussing the time frame during construction and how the alleyway will be impacted during that time. Um, I think the difficult uh, piece will be, as Mr. Brown alluded to, the height and what type of vehicles that can access that alleyway during that period of time though. Uh, Thank you so much. That uh, concludes my questions. I also wanted to recognize Ms. Alan Citrella for coming to speak on behalf of the DCA. She's one of our, she's one of my favorites, neighborhood leaders. Um, So thank you for uh, also your email. That was helpful. But that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, C. Dot, if you can stay up there. What, I'm sorry. What'd you say your name was? Casey Mashburn. Oh, hi, Casey. Um, so, there were some specific options that were named by the the um, residents, and I wanted to kind of go through them. So they asked for. So for me, I'll tell you. The business owner, there were, there were a couple reasons. The business owners not being able to access the, the, the deliveries or have deliveries. I mean, that's a non-starter for most of us, I think. Um, council member, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Melina, uh, a couple weeks ago, we shared concern about the, the growth in the city displacing small businesses, right? Mm-hmm. So this is, this is huge. So even for a day, a small business can't afford to, mm-hmm. to not have deliveries. So if you've got a shopping center, you, they have to be able to have their deliveries, period. So I don't know what kind of time, fr- I mean, there's just no, for me, there's no acceptable time frame that they would be closed due to construction. We already see that in, in residential areas where there's a, a challenge, but this is, I mean, these are very, very, compelling um, arguments. Um, we also heard from residents. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to know if, what would happen to this development if the alley was not closed? That, that's my first question, and I guess we can ask Colin that question, but I also heard different arguments. Um, we were told that trucks could get through. Um, no, we were told that trucks currently aren't able to get through the current alley. So I don't. So I'm. I'm yeah. I guess we can ask a resident. You know the, what the 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 problem is if they're not currently using that that. Um, I, I think um, trucks are currently driving through yeah. the parking lots back there that are that they but they could not stay within the ten foot alleyway. That's the issue. So I haven't seen this space. So they. Uh, okay, go ahead. So they're currently using it, or not. Let me ask, can I ask a resident? Let me ask a resident. Yes, thank you. You have, um, I, I don't believe wait, we, are, we have, we had a public hearing, so there's a question. Well, it's so closed. it's not, cl- I know, but we want to make sure she comes down speaking to the yep. um, microphone so that we can get on the record. Yeah, we're getting for the com- hearing. And I'm sorry, but we're, I'm hearing conflicting information. So in order for us to make a decision, we need to know the facts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Gina Colias, and I believe that the 18-wheeler is eight feet wide, so it does fit inside a 10-foot wide space, and it comes four times a week, and then they do have box trucks, also from Cisco, and then Amazon, and UPS. I have pictures of all the trucks coming through, and I gave all of you a picture of the Cisco truck coming through, but it has to be able to make a right turn on Scott, go down the alleyway, and the new development is going to have businesses on the bottom, and they're going to need deliveries, too. Okay, so did, you, did did Mr. Brown get a copy of this photo? I did. Okay. We, we think the trucks drive through there. They're driving outside the alleyway. Um, we've and and that's the issue. Is is there a way 
um, to continue access to the site. That's exactly right. Our site will need um, access. We just, we frankly um, are not sure that it's reasonable um, to require and or possible for a 10 foot alleyway to serve semi trucks. Okay. Um, so is there a way, she also, one of the residents also mentioned an, an easement. They mentioned um, increasing the height. And then they also mentioned realignment. So initially was the proposal or the plan to have the, um, the alley in a different space? There have been different conversations, that is correct. Okay. Uh, and one option, as you say, is to not abandon the alley. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the alley is not abandoned, Suncap can build its development, but we think probably none of the people you've heard from are happy because right. we don't think the truck can access it. We know it lines up directly with the neighbors who don't want it lining directly up with them. Um, it's just, it's not a great outcome. So further conversation, definitely warranted. We won't make all the people happy, including my clients, but my hope is that we come up with something that checks as many boxes as we can. So Suncap can move forward without closing the alley. That's correct. And how will that impact the development? They'll just have two different buildings okay. on each side of a 10 foot alleyway, which okay. you can't have two way of traffic on a 10 foot alleyway, which is why we're proposing 24 feet. Okay. Um, thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you. This might be a question for um, Debbie, but I want to make sure that we, we have said in April um, that it would come back. That is the motion right now on the floor. So um, the time to do this is considered. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, just a couple points here and that we have been in discussion with over the last uh, several weeks. The petitioner has the right to build up against the legal alley, but the legal alley is only 10 feet wide and so because it's open and unrestricted right now, there's no real issue with that. Um, and so that's why we wanna make sure we're getting to the right resolution for the small business owners and residents, um, and of course, the developer. Um, and, and Debbie might have to come up and speak to this as well, but it's my understanding that due to the process, the, the process for an abandonment of an alley, instead of a rezoning, for example, there is a certain time limit that is required to come back and address it before the process has to start all over again. So, sure. um, but can you, can you address that for us, please, ma'am? Hi, good evening, everyone. Debbie Smith, Charlotte Department of Transportation. And in fact, um, there is no immediate timeline. Uh, as long as you want to defer it, we offered some April dates that were the, the quickest available, but we want to help facilitate uh, as much conversation between the developer and the community as possible. Excellent. So with no timeline. So excellent. So with that, Madam Mayor, if I could amend my my um, substitute motion and say that we defer this issue to a business meeting in the future, giving time for the residents and small business owners and developers to come to a compromise. I'd also like to um, keep the public hearing open. We, we haven't closed it officially yet, so I'd like to keep it open so as this conversation continues, the residents will have an opportunity to come up again and be vocal around where we've landed as it relates to the compromise. I, I second that motion. Thank you for accepting my friendly amendment. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? We got Ms. Johnson? I'm sorry, one, one other question. Um, you mentioned the notice goes out to the direct, the adjacent owners and in the Metropolitan Times? No, um, that's just another thing. Mecklenburg, okay. Mecklenburg, I'm sorry, Mecklenburg Times. Times. Mm -hmm. So I've, am I missing something? I've never read the Mecklenburg Times. Is there anyone well, it's, that it's reads a that? I, I think one of the things that we have a problem <laughs> with is that the state 
outlines the process, not us, and it says published in a newspaper. The Mecklenburg Times is where you find all the houses uh -huh. that are for sale or taxes and all kinds. It's, it's basically a lawyer's. If, am I saying this correct? A lawyer's <laughs> newspaper. Yeah. Mayor, you're doing and, great. And I, and yeah. <laughs> that's why. And I get that. I think we had a daily recorder or something at home. So if you're looking for real estate, that's I mean, excuse me, not home, but in Ohio. This is home. But um, if you're looking for that, that's fine. But I think for the public, we do need to take a look at maybe putting the notice in the observer or um, we, we've talked about before, uh, next door or something like that. So we, if our goal is to communicate with the public, we need to be cognizant of where we're placing that. I mean, not, we can't expect members of the public to read that. Um, <laughs> That document, that, that newspaper. I don't think that uh, publication. Mayor, can we have Ms. Smith address my my amendments to the motion and this particular topic? Great, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Would love to be able to uh, continue and offer a suggestion that you are allowed to close the public hearing and that you would only need to defer action B, which is the decision, uh, and that that would be an acceptable motion for you to consider. Okay. So, Ms. Smith, just as we uh, consider that in the future, if there's, a, of course, movement on this particular issue, mm -hmm. would we be able to hear from the residents? Would they be able to come up and speak to that if we've closed the public hearing this evening? Right. I might need to uh, ask Casey on that one. So I believe you would have to, at that point, offer folks to come back up uh, to speak and ask them questions. Mm -hmm. um, however, if we do not open and close the public hearing today, then we would have to start uh, the process of intent over again, which is the two council uh, member action that you all are used to. So that would be a multi multiple month delay versus a potentially one month delay. All right, I'm looking at Mr. Baker. Yeah. Uh, typically when you want, because I know some of you want to continue the public hearing, but typically you do that to a date certain is my understanding. Um, mm -hmm. So I believe that they could continue it to a date certain and if for some reason you get information back from the staff that they need more time um, then you could just take it off of the agenda and put it on a, a future agenda that's that's sort of the, where, where you're headed if you wanted to do a if you wanted to allow folks to come back and speak on the matter Mm -hmm. particularly if you don't have, um, you know, complete resolution. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Baker, what should that motion, how would that motion be framed? I, I would, Lots of procedure here, guys, yeah. <laughs> just to give us a moment. And, and correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I, I would recommend that you, you uh, continue the item, uh, the public hearing, until the fourth meeting in April. Um, April 22nd. April 22nd, sure. And, um, and that gives them the maximum amount of, well, not maximum, but, but gives them a month to work through this. And it's on the agenda, so you don't have to do anything else um, absent hearing from the neighbors or the developer that they need more time. So, Mr. Mashburn, would that not, would that not trigger restarting the process over again if we were to do what city attorney just recommended? So Mr. Baker's the attorney. Um, <laughs> I will say the, the most important piece of that is that we have opened the public hearing and that is what was you adopted as an intent and then what was also published and distributed, uh, which I do think satisfies the general statutes that we are following the process correctly. So if Mr. Baker is comfortable with continuing the public hearing, then I am as well. Yeah, by, by doing this, you're giving the public notice that right. the, the, the hearing will start up again on the 22nd. Mm -hmm. right. So we have a motion on the floor to um, have, we can close the, do we close the public no, hearing? We're not gonna close the public hearing. We're not closing it, and hearing. we're gonna have another a motion on the floor to remove this item until the last meeting, the last business meeting continue, in April. The, the operative so, word is continue. We're continuing continue. the hearing Excuse me. on continue. April Continue. Okay, it's continue. All right, we're good. <laughs> Till the last meeting in April yep. of the City Council. Okay. All right, with yes. you? All right, so to go. now we're ready to vote. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.
Next item on our agenda is a public hearing for the Alverton Area Voluntary Annexation a, and adopt a, a, an annexation ordinance with the effective date of March 25, 2024 to extend the corporate limits to include this property and assign it to the adjacent City Council District 4. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do you have a second? Do I have a second? A second. 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 <laughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? All right. The next item is the city manager's report. Do you have a report? No report. Uh, no. No report. The next item is item <coughs> 11. Um, Adopt a resolution authorizing and approving an installment financing contract for the proposed financing and calling for the execution and delivery of various documents necessary to complete the sale of COPS. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? That's unanimous. Item 12, sale of city-owned land for West Sugar Creek redevelopment. Adopt a resolution approving the sale of 4.32 acres of city-owned property at 5342 Reagan Drive and 5350 Reagan Drive and to Prosperity Hidden Valley LLC for $1 for the development of affordable housing, authorizing the manager to negotiate and complete the sale. Is there any, a motion? So we have second. a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Anderson. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. If I could just um, add some brief comments. I'm just very excited about the progress and um, the speed which this has occurred. You guys will remember it was about a year ago where we had a debate around whether we should do that. And uh, within that amount of time, we have closed, selected, remediated, relocated, and found a good partner in less than one year. So um, when we say city government moves slow, in certain cases, we can move quickly. And um, I, I also want to say that many of the other residents who were used this motel as home, they've all been rehoused, and some of them have found permanent housing that they deem is better. So um, Prosperity Hidden Valley is, is joining us this evening. They've been selected as our developer. They have ties to the community. They are uh, committed to building quality product that is for sale affordable homes that is directly um, abutting historic Hidden Valley neighborhood, which is a for sale um, affordable uh, home community. So I couldn't be more pleased with the, the progress that we're making and understanding that affordable housing is a fundamental right to everyone who lives in our community and everything that we can do on council to ensure we are providing safe, support, supported, safe, safe supported, supported. affordable, <laughs> I'm trying to say affordable, <laughs> <Okay>. affordable, <laughs> sta stable housing. Um, then uh, we should be committed to that effort. So thank you, all of you who voted in support of this. Thank you for your continued support. And so happy to see uh, Mr. Kennedy up there and uh, looking forward to the work that you'll do in the community. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, any further discussion? Yes, I do. I have. All right, Ms. Sajmira and yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes, and thank you, Madam Mayor. I share the excitement here um, our corridors of opportunity program has come a long way i think earlier today during the budget we were discussing how our funds how our dollars has been matched by the uh, federal government and has really helped us tackle affordable housing public safety uh, in our communities so i'm certainly very happy to have supported uh, corridors of opportunity initiative specifically uh, the purchase of this motel that uh, aligns with our corridors of opportunity goals for this specific corridor. In fact, I was talking to business owner uh, in Sugar Creek Corridor a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I met this young lady uh, who is a business owner. She talked about how she has seen investment come in past two to three years that she hasn't seen in decades. Um, so this is a an investment in an under investment com in under invested community. Uh, this is um, this has certainly been a long overdue. So. Uh, 
residents as well as business owners in Sugar, Sugar Creek Corridor have certainly appreciated uh, the effort that we are putting to help our all of our corridors safe, affordable, and equitable. All right, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this is exciting. There's a fine line uh, between improvement and and gentrification and displacement. We, we know that. So so when this hotel was sold, you know, the, 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 the folks that live there who, who couldn't afford market rate or have a criminal background or eviction on their record, um, they were required to move other places. So it's good to hear that they're in a better situation. Mm -hmm. um, also, this is a, this is an advantage or a benefit for that area. And I, I'm happy that we are intentional about uh, the affordable housing in that area. And it's Mr. Kimbra, what's, I'm sorry, Kim? Kennedy. Kennedy, okay, all right, okay, Kennedy, I'm sorry. So I'm very happy, I think that this is, um, again, attention, intentional and deliberate of um, an equitable approach to redevelopment. So I'm looking forward to supporting this as well. Thank you. All right, we have a motion on the floor. And um, all in favor, please raise your hands. Anyone opposed? Thank you, everyone. All right, the next item is item 13, authorizing the manager to negotiate and execute an agreement between Charlotte Arena Operations and City of Charlotte in an amount not to exceed $30 million for additional Spectrum Center improvements and $30 million for the city's investment in a new practice facility development, adopting a budget ordinance, appropriating the same, the $30 million in proceeds from COPS and the Tourism Capital Projects Fund for, an, for additional arena improvements and repairs, adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $30 million and proceeds from COPS in the Tourism Capital Projects Fund for the city's contribution to the practice facility and authorizing the manager to execute the appropriate agreements. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, so now we'll just start with discussions. Ms. Watlington. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just circle back to the conversations we've been having ongoing with, in, in regards to economic development um, contracts and activities. And I just want to make sure that we're clear about the expectation before the contracts are actually executed, that any substantial change to it, any um, specifics that need to be finalized do, do come back to council, even if it's not a formal uh, vote necessarily. but. I'm particularly interested to make sure that our city attorney's office is involved and that we're advised accordingly um, at, the, at the final, right before the final execution of the contract. So I'd like for Mr. Baker to speak to uh, the role that, that we should expect from the attorney's office as we go forward. Uh, thank you for that, um, Dr. Wallington. Um, in the RCA, there is reference to expected future city council engagements, which include an update on the final agreement prior to execution. Um, that has been a conversation that I've had with several of you because you don't have a contract in front of you. You've got deal points, um, and a contract has to uh, c come about uh, uh, with that. Uh, so right now, you know, the, these deal points are going to be the, the, the ingredients, if you will, of, of whatever it is that we're, we're actually uh, baking here. And if there are going to be changes to those ingredients, uh, material changes, and that, that should certainly come to council so that you've got an understanding as to what that is. Um, I'll certainly work with the, uh, the administration as we go uh, through the process of putting this contract together. Uh, if there are some material changes, that need to get to council. Uh, there are multiple ways that we can get that information uh, to you. If it's a substantial enough change, we can just bring it to a meeting uh, and have you make an, you know, an adopt, adopt whatever uh, that particular change is. If it's um, relatively minor or what have you, because you really should know this is a big chunk of, this is, it's a huge uh, investment and a, and a really transformative uh, investment in uh, that building. And you should know what it is that we're doing uh, despite the fact that you've given the uh, the manager the authority to do that, and we will certainly update you, and, and I will certainly provide an independent uh, update uh, for you as we go with the, the chronology and uh, and the status of, of the discussions as we go forward. 
Thank you so much for that. And the only other thing that I will add is that I know that I've asked this on a number of occasions prior to this particular um, engagement. But as we look at participation, MWSBE, I want it to come back to us. I want us to understand what are we actually spending um, because I know that we've had trouble in the past collating that information and the information that, thank you, that uh, staff has provided it's clear that there are, some, there are some dots missing. And so while we work to get that information, I wanna make sure that we start out um, with the end in mind on this one. So definitely before the contract is executed, I wanna make sure that we're clear about what that's gonna look like in terms of MWSBE tracking. Thank you. Mr. Jones, you've got that? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, so we have Mr. a- Graham. Mr. Graham? Thank you, Madam. Coming around, we're okay. coming around. Oh, <laughs> you like with that? Uh, uh, I, I support the transaction. I've explained why in the past. I'm not going to repeat that unless there's any suspense about the outcome of this vote. So I think we should do it. Thanks. All right, Mr. Graham. Uh, same here with Council Member Drakes. Just wanted to note um, there were two items that came out of the committees that we wanted to make sure that were in the, um, the deal points. One was community usage of the of the practice facility, and that was uh, noted in item number 23 in our package that we received from the deal point, so more activities at the, uh, the practice facility itself. Um, I thought the deal points that were slayed out that we received for the weekend was uh, um, good, mm -hmm. right? I think it really is a, a great step in the right direction so we can kind of see how these things are being laid out and certainly having the city attorney come back to us once we begin to dot I's, cross T's are extremely important. Um, Again, the MWB participation, I think Council Member Wallington has already referred to it, but not only this project, but other high profile public projects that we're participating in should be kind of take be um, separated from all the other stuff that we do, like the Pearl. We made a, a number of commitments for um, MWB participation, workforce development activities, et cetera. We should be receiving periodical updates in reference to that, as well as any other future um, agreements that we would make that requires a huge outlay of public funds should be a part of it. One of the things that I did not see, and hopefully this could be one of those um, deal points that that are refined, was uh, community usage of the arena itself. I know we talked about it at the, um, the Economic Development Committee and we've seen some language that was old language. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, again, that there's some conversation um, going from the city to the, the new ownership of the, um, of the Hornets in reference to um, community usage of the arena itself, understanding that there's a lot of complexities with that, that um, hopefully there is um, the city attorney is taking a look at the language um, uh, in reference, which is old language, um, that we revise and reflects well, what it is that we're trying to do in the future in terms of the city trying to um, identify a wide variety of economic development uh, opportunities for the city where the arena may be a major factor of saying yes or no. Certainly the arena goes beyond um, just NBA basketball, there's concerts and a wide variety of other um, activities uh, and as we begin to grow our footprint internationally there are a lot of people that are looking at coming to Charlotte and the arena is a part of the equation of coming or not. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Graham hit on a lot of great points. I would just extend that and say not only uh, the community benefits that we've discussed at various meetings for the Spectrum Center but also the new PEC the Performance Enhancement Center, as well as an NBA branded property that would, could bring great extension to the community as it relates to use. So I'm, I'm glad that we are at a point where we can uh, revise this agreement and move forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm gonna be very brief like Council Member Driggs. Uh, the, the deal maker for me was the Hornets investment between seven and a hundred million dollars and council member Wadler then touched on it 30 percent participation for minority to small business so thumbs up for me Miss Johnson thank you madam mayor I just want to be clear and transparent on the total cost so uh, mr. Uh, Jones can 
can you clarify for me uh, and for members of the public the total cost? Is, do I understand it's $30 million today for the practice facility, um, $60 million we, that we've already, that we pre previously approved, $60 million for the performance um, enhancement center, and then $215 million for the improvements? I'm going to have Tracy come up. It's. Uh... Johnson, just to answer your question, the previous agreement was $215 million for the arena and $60 million for the practice facility. What this agreement does is move $30 million of the $60 million from the practice facility to the arena, leaves $30 million in the practice facility, and then the new Hornets ownership would cover the additional cost of the expanded practice facility, which is estimated to be an additional $70 plus million. So the total city investment is 275 still million. 275 so the the only difference is we're just reallocating the 30 million of the we're reallocating the 30 million but then we're also talking about now instead of 50 percent of the gravel lot the entire gravel the entire gravel lot too and so what we went through was the trade-offs of what as we renegotiated the deal what the hornets alleviated from us as responsibilities and then us uh, allowing them to look at the other half of the gravel lot for five years okay thank you thank you miss molina uh thank you madam mayor pro tem um i'm brief um actually i'm a little distracted a few of our ceasefire friends found my personal page and start sending me threats um, so it's pretty unfortunate, uh, like constantly back to back threatening me. Uh, don't know why they picked me, but, um, totally outside of the scope of what we're talking about. Um, my deal maker was, um, council member Driggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was his, um, uh, comparative, uh, his mathematics, his mathematics and, and gifts and calculations in comparison to what we had uh, versus what we're gaining um, as far as fiduciary responsibility is concerned. So I'm really excited to see this go forward. Um, staff, I thank you guys for your work on this, and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Ms. Ajmer? Thank you. Um, so for me, it was that private sector was bringing 70 to $100 million investment that we didn't have before. So that's, that's a big commitment in our center city. Uh, in addition to that, I will echo Council Member Molina that it was Mr. Drake's mathematics, mathematical calculations. <laughs> because in fact, I had expressed concerns about investing $30 million towards the facility that we do not own. But then when you look at, uh, when you add up all the numbers about maintaining the facility, uh, when you look at uh, other construction delays and we would have to pay the penalty, when you add up all those numbers, it makes sense. So I think, Mr. Driggs, you should have your uh, reconciliation spreadsheet in the records, because I think that is, I, I, that's the kind of details I think uh, staff should be preparing. Uh, for us as we make these important decisions. Um, <clears throat> but then also, I, I have a question about um, something, I wanted to follow up on something Dr. Watlington had raised about MWSBE program. Uh, Ms. Dotson, if you can just share with us, are there any program audits being done to ensure there is compliance with MWSBE commitments that are being made? For this particular project and the arena project so far, um, we are trying to track that. I think was we have had questions about various projects, and Renee, keep me honest here. Um, but if we've had pro questions about various projects, we we have found that some gaps in the tracking, and we're working now to fix that for all projects going forward, um, so that we can better track everything as as needed. So that that's helpful. I. I think moving forward, we need to have a policy in place or some sort of audit being done to ensure that there is compliance with the commitment. Um, for an example, if there is a commitment being made of 30%, uh, we need to go back uh, before the project is complete um, to ensure that there is 30% commitment was fulfilled. 
just like we do with other city commitments, right? Um, to ensure the integrity of uh, and for transparency as well. But that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you. I, since I've been pointed at uh, as the numbers guy, I want to clarify. Uh, we had a $275 million commitment in 2022, and we have one now. There were other obligations that we went through yes. item by item, yes. right, that we would incur in relation to the 2022 in addition. And now, under the 2024, we have different ones, different. okay? And the balance on the whole is just about flat. Uh, and I did want to take this opportunity also to just uh, thank the owners of the team for their investment in Charlotte and hope they appreciate our investment in the partnership we have with you. Look forward to some winning seasons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be great, but we'll take a good concert any day of the week. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we very much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this, um, to have this team continue to be a part of the city because those kinds of things do make a difference in a city's ability to attract and, and, and also in, engage and encourage people. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So, Excuse me, Mr. Jones. Point of order. Oh, Ms. Watlington, I'm sorry. I was, you're fine. Swing. Um, I just want, while you were there, um, I absolutely support the idea of, of a policy for tracking. Um, I was just speaking with the attorney in regards to, I'd love us to understand as we're putting together that kind of policy, what is our leverage as the city? I see we're participating in um, selections, if you will, or at least interviews for a uh, construction manager. What I don't see is a participating in design team interviews. Um, and I, I know that we've had a lot of conversations about what we can do at the city to make sure that we're filling that pipeline and that there is capacity there. I want to see us take a much more active role in that because I think it would be uh, a miss if we ended up in a situation where good faith efforts were executed, but we didn't hit our goals or even get anywhere near them, and we not find that out until the back end of the tracking piece. So. Yeah, and I'll just say that on large projects like this, we actually, I work closely with general services and that team to advocate to have a seat at the table as early as possible, as often as possible, just because there's so much benefit of us collaborating and working and working together. Sometimes we're in their own design team, sometimes we're not, sometimes it's just the CMAR, it, it, just, it varies, but we do advocate to get in there as early as possible and keep a seat at the table through the whole process so we can ensure things just like this. Absolutely, and I would even lean in beyond the advocating. If we're putting public dollars towards it, we demand a seat at the table because I, I don't see a situation in which we're putting up 270 some odd thousand or million dollars and we don't have a seat at the table at all places. So definitely want to follow up on that one and make sure that that one shows up. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Jones. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so I just want to take this opportunity, Mayor, members of council, uh, one, to, to thank the team for being able to um, pull together the deal. I think that's very important. But also to highlight that uh, earlier uh, last year, council moved up small minority women-owned businesses as one of the strategic initiatives. So we as an organization, ED, CBI, General Services, Finance, have been um, taking a stronger, more focused look at what we're doing. So when you do things like that, you will find mistakes and gaps so we're gonna own those mistakes and gaps as a team and close those because, again, you lifted this up over a year ago and we're um, making progress. We'd like to go faster, uh, but, but we are doing this through a collaborative approach. Is that internal audit doing it? Who is tracking? Internal audit is, we're all looking at this and we're starting to see opportunities for improvement. Yes. All right. Okay. So do we have a motion on the floor. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Ms. Johnson is opposed. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I think our next item um, goes to the nominations. That we go to the city clerk for the report of the council nominations. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And I will say up front that there are several um, advisory boards that um, individuals received um, six or more nominations. So at the conclusion, if council so chooses, you could there could be a motion and a second to appoint uh, those individuals. Um, so with that, 
to begin with the Business Advisory Committee for the uh, Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, um, Lindsay Hasser Archeli, the incumbent, received 11 nominations for the Latin American Chamber of Commerce. Christian Gallardo received 11 um, nominations. The Charlotte Business Inclusion Advisory Committee, uh, the at-large positions will come back uh, to you at your next uh, business meeting. For the at-large representing a prime construction company for Charlotte Business Inclusion, the incumbent Gary Bill received eight nominations. For the um, Hispanic Contractors Association of the Carolinas representative, Carolina Schaffner, the incumbent received mm. 10 nominations. For the Latin American Chamber of Commerce, Pacino Monsialis received 10 nominations, as did uh, Rebecca LeClaire for the Metrolina Native American Association. For the um, Historic District Commission, Sean Sullivan received nine nominations. For the Enlivian Board of Commissioners, uh, Angela Ambrose received 11 nominations. For the Neighborhood Matching Grants, Anthony, and this is for the business representative, Anthony Chadwick, the incumbent, received 10 nominations. For the neighborhood representative, um, the following persons received 11 nominations. Phyllis Barnett, Jeffrey Simpson, and Jonathan Utrup, both of which are incumbents. And Jason Wager, or Wager received um, 11 nominations. For the nonprofit sector representative, the incumbents, Rhonda Dean and Philip Gusman, received 11 nominations. We will bring back the um, passenger vehicle for hire at the next business meeting if there are any applicants. And for the Transit Services Advisory Committee, Juan Contreras Suarez received 11 nominations. Do we have a motion to accept the nominations for those that meet the criteria that we have? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of that motion? Please raise your hand. Motion all right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Yes, you can.